Good morning and welcome to the Senate Committee on Commerce and Labor for the 81st session. And before we begin, I'd like to ask everyone to please mute your microphone when you are not speaking to minimize background noise. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Senator Hardy. Here. Senator Lang. Here. Senator Neal. Here. Senator Pickard. Here. Senator Scheibel. Here. Senator Settlemeyer. Here. Chair Spearman. Here. Thank you. And let the record show that all members are present. I'd like to remind everyone that we are doing everything virtually right now to make sure that we minimize the spread and infection rate of COVID-19. We're doing all things virtually. Uh, committees will be held virtually. Uh, staff and members of the committee and everyone else will be participating either uh, through video conference, telephone, or you can watch us on uh, YouTube to make sure that you are uh, keeping informed with what's going on. I want to welcome our audience that's joining us remotely. I'd like to, remind, <clears throat> like to remind all of our members that if you have a question, please use the um, raise hand button on the Zoom and uh, make sure that anyone who is speaking, committee members or those who are presenting, uh, would like to ask you to please project your voice. Um, and uh, if you need to get closer to your microphone, you can do that. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's not going to bite, but it will allow people who are listening over the internet to hear what you are saying, uh, reminding everyone that if you present false testimony, either the chair or any member of the committee can ask for uh, documentation for your testimony. Today we have a hearing on Senate Bill 408 and work session on Senate Bills 186, 198, 260, 276, 282, 293, 295, 307, 308, 335, 381, and 402. Uh, that's the latest count that we have. And um, hopefully we will not be here until 2 o'clock this afternoon, but uh, we want to make sure that we give um, 408 thorough vetting and allow time for any questions uh, during the work session. Reminding everybody, the work session is not a time to uh, represent the case. It's simply a time if members have questions that they can ask those questions and hopefully get those questions answered. Uh, if you have an amendment, and I got several that were late, um, but if you have an amendment for 408, if you've not shown it to the sponsor, I'm not going to entertain it. You have to show the sponsor uh, that the, you have an amendment. You should have also uh, sent it via email and put in the, in the email what your uh, amendment was going to do. Is it friendly or not? Uh, what is your intent? And make sure that uh, the sponsor is in agreement or actually knows what you're going to do and is prepared to respond. You can still participate with us. Uh, and even if you uh, click the participate button, there's really no guarantee that you will have an uh, opportunity to speak. And that's because just like when we were in person, they're limited by time constraints. Um, we're limited by, by time constraints because other committees will have to use um, some of the same equipment that we're using, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I'm going to announce the time for every segment, um, how many minutes and um, how many uh, minutes per person, and would hope that everyone would adhere to that. And please remember that if someone has already said, in essence, what you want to say, ditto is a good response, and that will allow more people to testify. Uh, but if you use the entire two minutes to talk about the same thing that the four people in front of you said, then that means that the four people behind you may not have an opportunity uh, to testify, even if they have something different. Pay attention when you're on the phone uh, to which bill is being considered and follow the verbal prompts provided by BPS so that you know which keys to press and raise your hand or unmute yourself. Staff will call on you to speak by the last three digits of your phone number. And detailed instructions for participating in committee meetings are also available on the help page which is linked at the banner <clears throat> in the banner at the top of every page on Nellis. If you need assistance with any of these processes or would like to receive electronic notification, please make sure that you contact our committee staff on the email that's listed on the agenda. And so now let's go to Senate Bill 408. 
and Senate Bill 408. Um, Mr. Brett Kent, State Board of Pharmacy, Richard Tommaso, Nevada State Board of Pharmacy. So, uh, Mr. Kent, are you ready? And Senate Bill 408 revises provisions relating to the State Board of Pharmacy. So, Mr. Kent, please begin when you are ready. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. For the record, Brett Kent, General Counsel for the Nevada State Board of Pharmacy. Thank you, Chair Spearman and members of the committee for your consideration of SB 408. As a preliminary matter, I have submitted an amendment to delete sections one and 12 in their entirety and delete the proposed language in section three at page four lines 28 and 29. So I will not take up the committee's time with those sections, please disregard them. With me today is Richard Tommaso, the public member of the board who will make a brief comment before I take you through the bill. Thank you, Councillor. Respected Senators, my name is Richard Tommaso, and I'm currently the Vice President of Security Surveillance and Government Affairs for Mesquite Gaming. Approximately a year and a half ago, I was honored to be appointed by Governor Sisolak as the public member to the Board of Pharmacy. Coincidentally, at the time I was appointed, Governor Sisolak's Division of Internal Audit had just finished their review of the Board of Pharmacy and left us with five recommendations. Four of these recommendations were easily complied with and are practiced today by the staff and the Board of Pharmacy. The fifth one, however, was at recommendation was that the Board of Pharmacy require applicants for pharmacists and pharmacist technicians to require background checks, fingerprint background checks. This, however, would take a legislative action and that's why Bill, Senate Bill 408 is before you. The auditors also noted that four of the surrounding states, Arizona, Oregon, Utah, and Washington, all require background checks for their pharmacists and technicians. They also noted that four of our medical boards here in Nevada require background checks, our medical board, our dental board, our therapy board, and our nursing board. To me, this is shocking because it's the board of pharmacy who I feel needs it more than the others, and here's why. All of the legal drugs that come into the state of Nevada are given to the pharmacist and the pharmacist technician for their storage, inventory control, and dispensing to the general public. But just before I got into the gaming industry, I want you to know that I spent 31 years as a special agent with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. In fact, my last eight years were done right here in Nevada investigating federal narcotics violations. That was my specialty and my expertise the investigation of federal narcotics violations. The greatest tool I had for vetting the subjects that I was investigating were the background checks. Background checks reveal a person's character, their flaws, their tendencies their, to, to commit another crime and their uh, the ability to make mistakes as they move forward. The Bureau of, I mean, the Bureau, I'm thinking of the FBI, the Board of Pharmacy needs this tool to vet the men and women who have complete dominion and control over all of narcotics, legal narcotics, that are coming into the state of Nevada. The general public deserves the peace of mind to know that the drug that their doctor prescribed them is what is in the bottle that they pick up from their pharmacist. You yourself, Senator, you need to know with some degree of certainty that the prescription wasn't, your prescription that you picked up wasn't changed, diverted, substituted, or tampered with. The state of Nevada needs to know that the people entrusted as the repository and the guardians of the drugs in this state are done so by competent people. And senators, you yourselves are the general public. Help the Board of Pharmacy and the staff protect your self-interest and your safety as you move forward in this field. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. And so Chair Spearman, members of the committee, once again, Brett Camp for the record. Now I'm gonna take you through the text of the bill. Um, I wanna point out that this bill clarifies and makes more consistent various provisions of existing law that govern how the board operates. It implements recent recommendations that were made by either the Sunset Subcommittee or by executive branch auditors. And it allows the board to protect the public, which is its mission uh, to the greatest extent possible and to ensure that Nevadans receive safe, reliable pharmaceutical care. 
So going through the bill, section two removes a provision that clearly conflicts with the Nevada open meeting law. The spirit and intent of the law are that boards deliberate and take action openly and in public view. This is further reflected in NRS 622.320 subsection two, which mandates that all disciplinary proceedings of regulatory boards comply with the open meeting law. But currently subsection three of NRS 639.050 requires that our board's deliberations in such cases be closed to the public. Now this clearly conflicts with the mandate of openness and should that subsection should be deleted to provide further clarity in the law. Next, section three clarifies the board's authority to perform two essential functions. First, the board routinely enters into agreements with local, state, and federal agencies to coordinate our efforts and better protect the public. Second, the board has a BOE approved contract with APRIS to administer the prescription monitoring program database. That database tracks all controlled substance prescriptions to better coordinate patient care and prevent diversion, abuse, and overdoses. The board would like those two essential functions to be clearly specified in NRS 639.070. Next, section four amends NRS 639.100, and it really simplifies and clarifies in that statute that it's unlawful to manufacture, wholesale, compound, sell, or dispense a prescription drug in Nevada unless properly licensed by the board. Next, sections five and six would require that all applicants to be registered pharmacists or pharmaceutical technicians undergo criminal background checks. This is uh, the policy proposal that Mr. Tomasa was referring to. This recommendation was made in an executive branch audit. Currently, the only persons uh, that undergo background checks that are licensed by the board are persons that apply to operate as wholesalers. Uh, now, there are compelling policy justifications for requiring criminal background checks on pharmacists and pharmaceutical technicians to better protect the public. Many other states have such requirements. Ultimately, that's a policy decision that rests with you. Section 11 would make an a conforming amendment to NRS 639.510 to protect the criminal history of applicants from unauthorized use or disclosure. Next, Section 7 increases the statutory limits on the biennial fee to be licensed as a manufacturer or a wholesaler in Nevada. Would it increase that statutory cap from 500 to $1,000? This results from a sunset subcommittee recommendation that the board analyze its fee structure and revise fees to the extent necessary to support its operations. Currently, the board cannot increase license fees for manufacturers or wholesalers to cover the cost of regulating those activities because we're at the statutory limit. This will remedy that. I wanna emphasize that just because you increase the statutory limit, uh, the board itself would still have to amend its fee schedule in the Nevada Administrative Code uh, before any fee increase would take place. Next, section eight amends NRS 639.243 subsection two to conform to the 20 day time period to file an answer and notice of defense to administrative charges that is specified in NRS 622A.320 subsection one. Uh, the board and its administrative proceedings has to comply with NRS 622A and currently there's a conflict. 22A once again provides a 20 day response period. This uh, board's chapter in 639 only provides a 15 day response period. Of course, the board defaults to the longer period to assure due process. Uh, however, uh, it would be nice if we just reconcile the two and uh, the chapter uh, 639 reflect the, the same time frame of 20 days. Next, section nine clarifies the board's authority to place restrictions on a license when imposing discipline for violations of Nevada law, provided those restrictions are necessary for the protection of the public. For instance, if violations of law are related to a substance abuse problem, the board may require the licensee to undergo evaluation, treatment, and maybe place other restrictions to ensure that the licensee can practice in a safe manner. So the board would like its authority to place such restrictions on a license to be clearly specified in NRS 639.255. Next, Section 10 amends NRS 639.291 to clarify that it is unlawful to obtain any license from the board under false pretenses or to falsely represent oneself as the holder of a license. 
Finally, Section 13 repeals NRS 639.095. Now that section requires that the board provide free copies of the relevant chapters of NRS and NAC to pharmacists. The requirements outdated and unnecessary since all relevant laws and the most current versions of the laws are accessible on the board's website. Uh, thank you for your consideration of this bill. Thank you, Mr. Kent. Um, I see we have a question from Vice Chair Neal. Um, Vice Chair? And I'm sure that Senator Pickard's hand is out there. I just have to widen the screen to make sure that I see him. I see Senator Settlemeyer. Vice Chair? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were calling on Senator Settlemeyer. Okay, so I had a question on the um, on the background check. So I understand why it's being added. I get it, but so so let's say you find out that you know there's somebody, a pharmacist that's been out there, and ten years ago before they got their doctorate in pharmacy, there was a they there was something in their criminal background. What do you do with it? How far back are you looking? I don't see any of that in the in the bill. For the record, Brett Kant, thank you, Senator, for your question. Uh, and that's a great question. And once again, to give you the best example of how the board handles that information, I'll make reference to the current background checks that are conducted on uh, persons that want to be licensed to operate as wholesalers in the state. And in the instance where a somebody, uh, their background a check reveals that they uh, have a past criminal history, uh, be it an arrest or a conviction, uh, then uh, simply the, the board asks them uh, to explain the situation. Let's say it was a DUI, which is very common, and uh, it's provided the applicant's forthcoming, uh, the board weighs that and, and takes that into account. And quite frankly, the honesty and the forthrightness is the most important thing to the board in acknowledging their criminal background. Uh, and then the board can take that into consideration and make an informed decision as to whether uh, to issue that, that individual a license. And so I think the same thing would take place with regard to uh, any applicant for registration as a pharmacist or a pharmaceutical technician, uh, provided they are forthcoming uh, in disclosing their criminal past and that that matches up with the information uh, that the board has uh, after running the criminal background check and the board determines taking that into account that that individual uh, can practice safely uh, and not endanger the public and will not be a danger to themselves having access to uh, dangerous drugs and controlled substances uh, the board can take that into account as to uh, whether that's appropriate uh, to give that person that registration so Quick follow up, Madam Chair. So, so is the provision um, retroactive? Is this going to be applied um, when they do a renewal of the license? How is this language going to work? Once again, Brett Camp, for the record, thanks for that question, Senator. It's a great one. It's an important one because currently uh, the board licenses approximately 15,000 pharmacists and pharmaceutical technicians in our state. And uh, the board's intention was that this would be perspective uh, moving forward, uh, that uh, future applicants uh, for registration would uh, submit and undergo background checks. Uh, it had not intended that uh, they would go back and, and, and submit uh, fingerprints to the repository and conduct background checks on all the current licensees. And I would note that uh, for any uh, application for any license from the board, uh, currently uh, the applicant and on a renewal uh, is supposed to disclose uh, any uh, criminal events. Um, and when they do disclose that, once again, the board takes that into account. But this would actually give the board uh, the information uh, from running the background check as to whether the individual has been candid in disclosure. So thank you for that, because I'm just wondering on the renewal, if a person, let's say, because it wasn't a requirement, and yes, candid, candid, candidness and honesty has been understood, but something happened 15 years ago, they didn't remember it, they didn't put it on, you run a background check, and then next thing you know, 
candidness and honesty is questioned, but they could make the argument, well, but you didn't have, you didn't, you didn't tell me to go back 20 years. Like you didn't tell me to go back and to, or to delineate particular crimes or, or they put crimes that they felt may have been related to the job that they were doing or something happened in college. So I'm just trying to understand because the, the, it just inserts, but gives no parameters, right? As to a licensee who's trying to understand how does this affect me now? How will this affect me on renewal? And what should I be thinking about when I go up for renewal and this background check is in play and maybe there's something I forgot? For the record, Brett Camp, thank you, uh, Senator, for the, the follow up on that. And uh, I can just once again tell you from the experience with uh, the wholesale applicants, uh, if they have an event that took place 25 years ago, they remember it. Uh, most often, once again, it's 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 a, it involves uh, a DUI or an impaired driving charge or conviction. Uh, but uh, we found that people remember, and uh, the board prescribes uh, the application and approves each application form and on the application uh, request disclosure of, of any criminal event, whether it's an arrest, a conviction or otherwise. Okay. Okay. And so I ex felon goes to school, gets his pharmacy license, he would be okay or she to work. Uh, once again, the board realizes that people make mistakes. People can be rehabilitated. Mr. Kent. Oh, I'm sorry. Give us, yeah, give us your name. We just need to announce your name every time so that the I, I, Yes, my apologies. You, Thank you, you forgot already? You forgot already? <laughs> my apologies. Brett Camp for the record. Um, thank you for the follow up. And uh, once again, uh, the board realizes that people make mistakes. Uh, people can be rehabilitated and uh, their past doesn't necessarily disqualify them from the ability to safely practice uh, the, a profession uh, moving forward. And the board takes all that into account. Um, it's important, though, that the board know uh, a person's past, uh, especially with regard to uh, crimes that involve controlled substances uh, or drugs, um, since we're licensing individuals that have ready access to those medications. Got it. Thank you. I don't have a problem with that level of intent. I just wanted to understand the scope and the real life application of what's happening, being that this is new and the pharmacy board has been around for a long time. <laughs> hey, um, Senator Settlemeyer and then Senator Hardy. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate the opportunity. I was just trying to, I just found the amendment and I apologize. It took me a bit. So we're deleting sections one and 12 in their entirety. And those are really the questions, uh, the major problems that I had within the bill. So uh, let me continue to look at it. Sorry for taking up the committee's time. I just finally found the amendment. Sorry about that. Senator Hardy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, on section three, uh, K sub K or one sub K, uh, the salaries of the employees are exempt. Is that the statute that applies to pinning that to the governor's salary? Once again, Brett Camp, for the record, uh, that is the statutory provision. Uh, you're correct, Senator, but once again, we've submitted an amendment to delete that proposed language. So they, all of the employees that are listed above would uh, still be subject to the salary cap vis-a-vis uh, -vis the governor's salary? Once again, Brett, can't for follow up. Uh, that's correct. All all the uh, board's uh, employees and staff 
are and will continue to be subject to the statutory limitation of NRS 281.123. Thank you. Thank you. Additional questions, committee? Yes, Madam Chair, I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am, Vice Chair. So I had a question on the, the $500, the increase. I didn't, I didn't hear the justification for the $500 increase. What was, what was stated on the record, Mr. Kent? Uh, once again, Brett Camp for the record. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Senator. And once again, you establish in statute the, the cap on uh, the amount that the board can assess for a biennial uh, renewal, initial issuance or renewal of a license. The board statutorily operates uh, in licenses on a biennial basis. It's got 17 different licensing categories. And that's in NRS 639-170. And for wholesalers, uh, currently, and the wholesaler uh, fee for biennial renewal is $500. And that's we're up against the cap. The board's fee schedule, which is in regulation, is it's at $500. It's been $500 for over 20 years. Uh, the Sunset Subcommittee noted that noted that the fee that Nevada charges to license wholesalers is substantially less than that in surrounding states. And I realize that alone isn't necessarily justification uh, to increase the statutory cap. Uh, however, once again, uh, in terms of our regulatory activities to, to oversee and regulate the, the activities of wholesalers, and those of course are the individuals that are bringing drugs into our state, uh, there are enforcement costs and those enforcement costs have increased. Uh, probably the most notable one was when the legislature uh, mandated background checks on those wholesalers. Um, the, the fee was never increased as a result of that mandate. And, uh, and so their enforcement costs from running the background checks and regulating that activity, the wholesaling activity. And so the board could not, if it wanted to, uh, seeing justification for it to bring in sufficient revenue to cover those enforcement costs, increase the fee because they're up against that statutory cap. So we're proposing to increase that to $1,000. And once again, that doesn't mean uh, wholesalers are automatically gonna be subject to a $1,000 licensing fee. That means the board now has the authority to go back and increase the wholesaler fee by regulation to the extent necessary to cover those enforcement costs. And then just really quick on, because I meant to ask this 9G, which was that insertion of limitations. So placing any other restrictions on the certificate of license deemed necessary. So super broad. Um, so what what are the delineations for necessary right because i get it but is you know there's a point where you tied it to the criminal background but it, it does a little bit more than that and so when we talk about deems necessary for the protection of the public that's plenary and it's very broad and so how how will these justifications be illustrated um, where someone's license is, uh, which is their livelihood, um, is then restricted um, by this language. Thanks for the question, Senator. Once again, Brett Camp for the record. And it's a great question. The fact of the matter is the board already uh, places routinely certain restrictions in, uh, in, in imposing discipline on a licensee. Obviously, the board doesn't want to revoke or suspend somebody's license and take away their livelihood unless that's absolutely necessary to protect the public. So the board routinely if they deem it appropriate and fair and equitable and protecting the public uh, will uh, place a license holder on probation and then place certain conditions on that probation. Now, very common one I mentioned is that if the license holder has a substance abuse problem, that's common uh, with diversion where that was the violation of law that the license holder was diverting drugs from the workplace. Um, 
and require them to undergo evaluation and treatment, or they were they showed up for work and they were impaired, something of that nature, clearly tied to a substance abuse issue, uh, then require them to undergo evaluation and treatment. That's not listed in there, um, but it's something that commonly the board requires. Another thing is to require continuing education as a condition of probation or a, a, a a requirement on their license that they undergo some additional continuing education that's directly related to uh, the violations that occurred. Uh, those are probably the two most common, but it could be restricting, for instance, a pharmacist from acting as a managing pharmacist in a pharmacy for a certain period of time uh, until they've demonstrated during the probationary period that uh, they can practice safely because a pharmacy manager uh, is in charge of the pharmacy, uh, oversees the activities in the pharmacy. And, uh, and so sometimes it's appropriate to restrict a pharmacist from uh, working as a managing pharmacist uh, for a period until they can demonstrate the board that they can do so safely and responsibly. So those are some good examples of the types of restrictions uh, that the board places. And I just simply propose that uh, it be clarified in this statute that the board has that authority to place those types of restrictions in imposing discipline. So Madam Chair, just two quick follow-ups, just because this is just a nuanced area trigger something for me. Um, thank you for the answer. Um, but with that broad language uh, in the restriction um, and just thinking about, you know, situations where typically a due process can rise up when a license has been restricted under certain terms, right? And then they feel that their, when I said livelihood has been challenged and they have been denied. And I understand the framework here, but because of the broadness of the statement, I wonder how, what's the appeal under deemed necessary when a pharmacist was to challenge and that broad plenary power is being stated, what then would be their appeal right under that plenary power that that sentence really is creating? For the record, once again, Brett Kent, thank you, Senator, for the question. It's a very good one. And anytime the board imposes discipline, uh, that order uh, is subject to judicial review and the uh, the licensee that's subject to that, that disciplinary order uh, can petition for judicial review of it. Uh, and then a judge uh, looks at it in district court and determines whether uh, the board um, exceeded its authority or uh, it, it, as you're alluding to whether the restrictions they placed on the license really are necessary to protect the public. Yeah, thank you for that. Cause that was, you know, cause exceeding authority can be challenged because it's plenary. So there's very slim areas when you have that kind of statement, but I'll leave it there. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you. I see Senator Settlemeyer's hand. Thank you for the second time, uh, Madam Chair. But as usual, uh, Senator Neal has covered the question. I was also asking about Section 9G, placing any other restrictions on the certificate licensee or permit holder as the board deems necessary for protection of the public. It seems extremely broad, but I just want to make sure we get it on record that this is only being done only if it is dealing with health and safety concerns. And again, they have to draw a nexus to that in order to put those type of restrictions on, correct? Uh, once again, Brett Kant, uh, for the record, uh, thank you, Senator, for the question. And yes, have to draw a nexus has got to be a direct relation to the restriction and uh, how it's necessary uh, to protect the public uh, in that licensee's activities. Thank you. Many members, additional questions? Seeing none. Broadcast. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me uh, let me get uh, Mr. Keene to comment, <clears throat> excuse me, on what may be a discrepancy on page 11. Mr. Keene? Thank you. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Will Keen, Committee Council. Uh, it just seemed like there was a typo and I thought it would be good um, to take a look at that. It's on page 11, line 12. There's a reference to a paragraph S of subsection one of NRS 639.070. And 639.070, it is amended in this bill, but in section three, but there does not appear to be a paragraph S. So I'm assuming that's a typo and just for, should refer one, to one of the other paragraphs. Uh, it, it, that's a question for me, once again, Brett Camp, for the record. Uh, I can tell you that uh, the language that I submitted to LCB for drafting, it was supposed to make reference to uh, those sections uh, that were going to allow for criminal background checks of pharmacists and pharmaceutical technicians. So this uh, existing statute says that for criminal background checks that are conducted on wholesalers, that the board's got to uh, take reasonable measures to prevent the unauthorized use or disclosure of that criminal history. Um, and so it was supposed to be amended to reference that they would also have to take that appropriate uh, uh, measures to protect any criminal history uh, that's submitted in connection with an application to be a pharmacist or a pharmaceutical technician. So in terms of the actual reference, I, I don't, I didn't draft the, that, so. Thank you. I, I see that that's what uh, 639, 127, 639.137, 1, and 639.05.500 do. Um, well, perhaps we can talk uh, afterward. I, I don't see what the paragraph S of subsection one uh, should be referring to, um, but if it's okay with the chair, I can just talk to Mr. Kant afterward and we can work out what that reference should be. Uh, well, it would be, except this is the last day that bills have to come out of committee and I would like to, as much as is possible, make sure that <clears throat> when I ask committee members to vote, they know exactly what they're voting on even if we're talking about a conceptual. So we will, uh, when we can finish this bill, we will put it last. And Mr. Kent, that will afford you all an opportunity uh, to fix whatever um, incongruencies that are um, in the bill right now, okay? So. Mr. Spearman. Yes. I'm sorry, Brett Kent for the record, if I may. I don't think that language on line 12 needs to be in there at all because the way it's been drafted, uh, the background checks for the pharmaceutical technicians and the pharmacists, that would that that authority you're putting into 639.127 and 639.1371. So I don't know that the, the 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 language that would be added in line 12 is even necessary. I think you just strike that out, make reference to the three uh, statutes, and that will accomplish the intent. So are you proposing a conceptual amendment? Uh, once again, Brett Camp for the record. Yes, I uh, I think uh, Legislative Council Sharp Eye has caught something and we would request that uh, in processing this bill and hopefully passing it, uh, that the, uh, uh, the committee just strike the proposed new language in line 12 on page 11 uh, in section 11. Thank you. Uh, Mr. King, uh, will that suffice your concern? Thank you, Chair Spearman. Uh, for the record, Will King Committee Council. Absolutely, we can do that. I will make a note of it. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Megalejo, if you will, <clears throat> Mr. Ken, if you will make sure that Mr. Megalejo gets the uh, information that we've got to, uh, we have to get to clear up to make sure that when I ask the committee to vote on it, they know exactly what they're voting on uh, to include the conceptual amendment. And I know that it's, um, <clears throat> Uh, it's a little tight, but uh, if we're going to get it out of here today, that has to happen. Okay. All right. Vice Chair Neal. You're on mute. Oh, sorry. I know this computer. Anyway, so thanks, Madam Chair. But based on the questions that I had on section uh, 9G, um, I really do want clarifications on the scope 
in a in in a in the amendment before it goes. Um, I, I can't vote for it on that broadness without getting an understanding of truly how it's going to work. So, like I know uh, Senator Settlemeyer asked about nexus. Um, I, I think that that is too broad, and I, I can't support it unless that is dealt with before it goes on to work session. Um, some kind of delineation around what is understood to be rights, um, due process, et cetera, nexus, you know, if we're going after certain things. Um, so I'm just, I'm just saying it. Normally, I wouldn't put something like this on the record, but because this is the last day, and if it doesn't, if it doesn't get amended before, you know, we we adjourn this hearing, this this committee, then I can't I can't support a bill that is open ended like that. Chair Spearman. Yes. Uh, once again, Brett Camp for the record. Uh, uh, I would also all include, include in language I provide to uh, your staff uh, an additional amendment that will strike uh, the proposed subsection G uh, on the, from section nine, page 10 at lines 30 through 32. We'll just, we'll strike it uh, so you can move on. And uh, I don't want uh, any of you to have any concerns. I mean, I didn't ask him to do that, but you know, I figured he had at least an hour, but um, whatever works or makes sense, but I, that would be okay if that's what he chooses and selects to do. Thank you. Um, I don't see any additional questions from many members. So let's go to the phones now. Broadcast, we'll go to the phones, those in support. <clears throat> We'll go uh, 15 minutes, I'm sorry, 20 minutes and two minutes per person. Thank you, Chair, good morning. To testify in support of SB 408, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 685, please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good morning, Chair Spearman and members of the Senate Commerce and Labor Committee. For the record, my name is Daniel Perros, spelled D-A-N-I-E-L-P-I-E-R-R-O-T-T -T, with our Jensen Partners. Today, I am testifying in support of SB 408 on behalf of our client, Fingerprinting Express. We, do, you, you, excuse me, uh, we utilize the latest technology of fingerprint background checks in addition to a myriad of other services to ensure the safety and security of Nevadans. Currently, there are over 80 industries in Nevada that are required by statute to receive fingerprint background checks. For that reason, we are in support of this legislation, as we see it is a step in the right direction. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits of 528, please slowly spell and state your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good morning, Chair and members of the committee. Liz McMiniman, L-I-Z-M-A-C-M-E-N-A-M-I-N, representing the Retail Association in Nevada. As many of you know on this committee, um, I have worked for the last 20-something years representing the pharmacy industry, and we work very closely with the board. Um, I We are in support of this bill as amended and would like the committee to know that I needed to clear up because when I, I uh, signed in, I originally signed in in opposition with concerns, but those concerns have been discussed openly. And so now I am able to sign in. Thank you. Thank you, caller. If you recently just joined us, we are currently in support of SB 408. To testify in support, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, you have no more callers in support at this time. We'll go, <clears throat> go to those in opposition. Same time frame, 20 minutes, two minutes per person. 
To testify in opposition of SB 408, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Again, to testify in opposition of SB 408, please press star 9. Chair, you have no callers in opposition at this time. We have anyone uh, weighing in neutral? To testify neutral on SB 408, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair Spearman. Again, to if I may. Chair Spearman. Yes. Uh, this is Warren Lohman, the administrator of the Division of Internal Audits, the Governor's Finance Office. Uh, we would like to just put on record that we agree with the bill as, as it's amended and want to thank the board and their staff leadership for moving decidedly to implement our audit recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. Again, we are currently on neutral testimony for SB 408. If you would like to testify neutral, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, you have no more callers left neutral at this time. Thank you. Um, and with that, uh, Mr. Kent, do you have any closing remarks? Uh, I, I don't. I just want to thank, once again, Brett Kent, for the record, thanks to the committee for, I know you're under a, a lot of a lot of time crunch, so thank you so much for listening to our testimony and considering our bill today. Thank you. And with that, we will close the hearing on Senate Bill 408, and we will get started on our marathon work session. Uh, I'll go now to Mr. Magorejo. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Cesar Magrejo, for the record, can be policy analyst. Uh, it looks like you want to take some of the bills slightly out of order. So I believe we will start with uh, Senate Bill 198. Uh, Senate Bill 198 provides for the regulation of an on, of on-demand pay providers. Uh, Matt Walker, representing Daily Pay, uh, proposes the following amendments. Uh, there is draft language attached. Uh, to this work session document. Uh, add a new subsection section 12 to, the, to prescribe the additional requirements and information that must be submitted to the commissioner by the applicant who wishes to be licensed as, as an employer integrated on-demand pay provider. Uh, add a new subsection section 12 to prescribe additional reasons for which the commissioner may refuse to issue a license. Amend section four of section 12 to include that unless otherwise specified in regulation, a license expires annually. Um, uh, add a new section to the bill to prescribe provisions governing the ability to regulate, investigate, and sanction employer integrated on demand pay licenses. In addition, the amendment requires uh, the commissioner to submit a report to the legislature, which includes an analysis of, and any recommendations regarding on demand pay services and potential changes that may be warranted to the rules and regulations governing on demand pay services. Amendment number five is to amend section 15 to change from June 15 to April 15 when an employer integrated on demand provider uh, must submit certain information to the commissioner. Uh, next amendment is amend section 17 to further clarify that an employer integrated on demand pay provider shall not pursue certain actions against a user absent intentional and willful fraud by the user. In addition, a provider is prohibited prohibited from de debiting a user's bank account without such user's affirmative consent. Next amendment is to add a new section to the bill to include provisions concerning the requirement that each employer integrate on-demand pay licensee to have a, a enforce a surety bond payable to the state of Nevada for a value of $35,000. Amendment number A is to add a new subsection to the bill to require an employer integrated on-demand pay licensee to provide the division of financial institutions with 10 business days prior notice of certain proposed changes. 
during which time the division may notify the licensee that the division does not approve the change. If the division does not respond, the changes may take effect after 10 days. The division may withhold approval if the proposed changes are inconsistent with the requirements of this bill. A ninth amendment is to add a new section of the bill to provide that a licensee issued a license issued pursuant to this bill is not transferable or assignable. And finally, the, the last amendment changes the effective date to become effective upon passage and approval for purpose of adopting regulations and on January 1, 2022 for all the purpose. Madam Chair, that's all the amendments. Thank you. Um, committee, committee members, any questions or comments? Vice Chair Neal. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I I didn't remember, but I remember in the testimony, but I'm not sure if it was in the bill language. Is there a limitation on how many times a person can access on demand in um, a month? And the only reason why I thought about this is because since the hearing, right, you know, I, you know, I have friends who borrow from their paycheck and then they find themselves without, um, like they're, and they're short on their um, bills because it becomes a it becomes something that they you know now they're missing six hundred dollars because they asked for an advance or etc. I want to know how many times they can use it in a month. Madam Chair, we do have the sponsors of the bill on the Zoom call. Can answer any questions? Yes, please. And when you answer, go direct. You don't have to go through me. Thank you, Chair Spearman. This is Alyssa Nabor for the record on behalf of Daily Pay. Um, to you, Vice Chair Neal, there is not a current limitation on the number of times that you may debit your um, account. We have historically understood that this is used only once a pay period time, and it actually keeps people and folks from using other predatory sources of, of credit. Uh, however, there is a requirement to report back to the legislature to understand if, in fact, that is a concern and to address that in um, 2023. Okay, so in two years, we're going to see how it works and then, and then establish limitations on it? Well, again, um, Vice Chair Neal, uh, Alyssa Naveworth on behalf of Daily Pay, uh, the understanding in, in the industry and the experience that they've had for multiple times, and I have Matthew Kopko from Daily Pay to go into more depth on this, is that this is not a product that is historically used in the same fashion um, as described, that this is not an issue. And so we believe that there should be strict regulations. We worked very hard to incorporate all of the regulations that um, the Financial Institutions Division um, would seek to have. And then we also proactively said, you know, we do not believe this to be a problem in our experience, and therefore we would submit a report to the legislature and address it if this problem did exist. But um, I also have Mr. Kopko from Daily Pay on the line who can go into a more granular detail on this issue. Hi, Matt, Matthew Kopko from Daily Pay for the record. Uh, Vice Chair Neal, your, your follow-up is correct. Uh, to the extent the recommendations are included to have additional restrictions that would be included in the report from FID. So yes, the idea would be to um, address if appropriate in 2023 to provide additional restrictions. Okay. So, and so there, so I don't, and you know, I'm, you know, I don't, I feel like two years out, um, why not just put in a cap now and say, you know, you can't use it over two times in a month or three times in a month, which you shouldn't be using it three times in a month if you're in a biweekly pay period. But if you're getting paid weekly, like some construction workers, um, it could be more than that. And I guess, you know, like overall, I get the policy overall, I understand. But I also want to make sure that a person doesn't hurt themselves or defeat themselves, which is the whole purpose of working and waiting to get paid. And, and only because I have, I just know, you know, I, I, I have specific um, examples of people that I know who work weekly and, it, and their money burns through their hands. I think they have a hole in their pocket, to be honest. And I think that, you know, being able to manage their money is the, is the broader purpose that needs to occur um, 
versus it just running through their hands because they're young and they're making a lot of money and it just gets spent. And then this opportunity to get an advance would further allow them to waste. And so I, I think, you know, not two years from now, but limiting their ability to do it multiple times um, in a month so that they actually learn money management is like super, super important to me. Uh, Matthew Koppel, for the record, uh, Vice Chair Neal, thank you for that. There had been an initial discussion in an earlier version of the conceptual amendment to have that report come back next year, 2022, so not in 2023. Um, there was a request um, so that FID could follow proper process that they have appropriate time to put together that report. Um, so we hope that it is on an acceptable timeline, but um, there had been a discussion of trying to get it done in one year, but the, the resolution of the of the coalition to try to reach uh, you know, time frame that would work for everyone, including FID, um, resulted in that decision to put 2023 in there. Okay, got it. Okay, Madam and um, Madam Vice Chair Nicole Canizaro, Senate District Six. Um, I definitely understand your concerns, um, and obviously, we had worked together in a group to come up with something, as Mr. Kopko said, um, would work for everyone. But certainly, um, happy to explore putting in um, some limitations um, and would be committed to working on that um, to hopefully answer some of your, your concerns as well, um, if, that is, uh, if that is acceptable for, for you, um, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you. I just, you know, brought it up, um, but everything just, but I hope that there's a conversation um, about it. So I just, I just know that this is reality that's going on with people. But I appreciate the comments, Majority Leader. Um, Vice Chair Neal, we really appreciate the comments as well, and we will continue to work with you um, as we proceed through the rest of this session um, in the coming weeks. So we'll circle back with you next week. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, um, Senator Pickard. Thank you, Madam Chair. Not a question uh, uh, because uh, Senator Neal just addressed one of my concerns. Um, uh, as I understand this, we're not talking about payday lenders. So, uh, um, we're, and we're talking about an opportunity for employers to pay their employees on a daily basis for wages they've already earned. So, uh, uh, and I recognize to the extent that, uh, because of the timing of transfers of documents, there may be a, uh, uh, a, a technical line of credit issued, but I don't think that that's uh, um, a justification for kind of a heavy handed regulatory approach to an emerging industry. Um, uh, I, I don't, I, I don't, it, what I keep hearing is that we don't really have it right. We, we know we need to make adjustments because, you know, uh, we're, we're making a lot of assumptions. And so I think that Although the intent is certainly uh, uh, laudable, I think that we have a situation where we really don't know what we're dealing with yet. Uh, uh, this will curtail uh, those that uh, want to get into the market. Uh, uh, it'll require businesses to uh, incur additional expense. Um, so I, I just can't support the bill uh, today. Thank you. Additional questions? Comments? Okay, Madam Secretary, please do a roll call vote. Madam Chair, we can take a motion. Oh, I'm sorry, motion. I learned that from Senator Raddy last night. <laughs> After a long day. Um, so I'll accept a motion. Motion to amend and do pass. I have a motion from Vice Chair Neal. Do I have a second? Second. Is that the second from Senator Lang? Or Senator Scheibel, what does it matter? Senator, Senator Scheibel, second from Senator Scheibel. Additional questions? Madam Chair? Yes? Traditionally, we always make a motion, then we make comments after that. So I was just kind of following that protocol, unless you want to change it up in the future, no. but I was just going with that. We uh, in that respect. Make comments. Make comments. Thank you, uh, Chair. In that respect, this bill I'd ask specifically, you know, what is the traditional low end? Because there has to be a return on investment at which they would not deal with a business. You know, are we leaving the small businesses out in the lurch? 
and I'd ask that question, they would not give me an answer of what traditionally is the lower range of employment. Now, obviously, if you're dealing with someone who has $10,000 a month as payroll, it's probably too small for them to deal with. And I wanted to try to get that answer. What type of businesses are we leaving out? And that was never provided to me. And I find that problematic when a member asks for a question and it's dodged uh, in that respect. But also within this, it seems that we're not involving all the people that are within this realm that wish to enter into this market. It looks like we're kind of picking and choosing winners and losers. And I also find that problematic as well. And that was stated in some of the testimony and also the concept of turning a lot of this over to the FID seemed to be to settle the contractual disputes seem to be a question as well. So for those reasons, I will be opposing it today. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comments? Madam Chair. Yes, Senator Hardy. Thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, was impressed with the eloquence of our Vice Chair and uh, recognize that we do have opportunity to do something, but something may not be good for everybody. I will be voting no, but reserving my right to change on the floor. Thanks. Okay. Additional questions, comments? Madam Secretary, please do a roll call vote. Senator Hardy. No, reserving my right to change. Senator Lang? Yes. Senator Neal? Yes. Senator Pickard? No. Senator Scheibel? Yes. Senator Settlemeyer? No. Chair Spearman? Yes. And I thought it could show that the motion does pass. And, um, I'll ask uh, Senator Canizaro if she'll take the floor statement. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Magorejo, let's move on to the next one. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the next bill uh, we will take is uh, Senate Bill 335. Senate Bill 335 revises provisions relating to professional and occupational licensing was sponsored by Senator Hardy. Uh, Senator Hardy proposes the following amendments and the first, uh, there's two separate documents attached to this work session document actually. The first set of amendments are from Senator Hardy, uh, which is to delete sections 262 through 301, which transfer the powers and duties of the State Barber's Health and Sanitation Board to the Division of Occupational Licensing. Uh, and second amendment is to amend section 314 to remove the sections of NRS that propose to abolish the, the state uh, barber's health and sanitation board. And the, the next set of amendments are to uh, are, are proposed by the Nevada Board of Homeopathic Medical Examiners. The first amendment is to amend section subsection one of section nine to require the administrator to appoint advisory boards pertaining to individuals licensed to practice athletic training, dentistry, homeopathic medicine, massage therapy, and oriental medicine to assist in carrying out the duties uh, to protect the public's health and safety. Second amendment is to amend subsection three of section nine to expand the duties of an advisory board. And the third amendment is to amend subsection four of, se of section nine to require that an advisory board be made up of a majority of members who hold a license to engage in the respective profession or occupation. But I'm sure this, uh, this morning, Senator Hardy uh, sent over an additional conceptual amendment, which is to change the effective date to January 1, 2022, uh, as well as uh, the division will consider input from licensees in the ongoing uh, relations, investigations, and making recommendations to the division going forward from time of passage. But I'm sure that's all the amendments. Thank you. Um... Committee members, any questions? Question? Chair Spearman, this is Senator Scheibel. Senator Scheibel, yes. Um, I'm reviewing the amendment from the Board of Homeopathic Medical Examiners and, and trying to, on the fly, do that comparison, but maybe the sponsor or the uh, of the amendment or, or the bill could just explain where this leaves the Board of Oriental Medicine. Thank you. 
Senator Hardy? You're on mute. Madam Chair, uh, if Terry Reynolds is still on board, uh, he has another meeting to go to. If he isn't on board, I would uh, welcome that opportunity to change. One of the challenges that we have with this uh, is that if we do something immediately, there's a cutoff of all the boards, and that is not the intention, and that is why the third conceptual amendment that I'm proposing this morning will change the date to January 1, where it actually takes effect. If And that uh, was in conjunction with conversation with Terry Reynolds, uh, when I uh, suggested that we have a later date for, uh, the, op, uh, for the implementation, because there are challenges with not just the uh, input from the boards that are currently active, but from the financial needs to make that transition. And that's what led to the, uh, the conceptual amendment this morning, which basically uh, would trump the uh, amendment that the homeopathic board made. Uh, so the division has need and knows that it needs to take uh, advantage of people who are in the boards and in the regulations, the investigations and the recommendations. So the homeopathic board's uh, amendment uh, would not be needed uh, and thus would not be considered friendly, uh, but the uh, first amendment and the conceptual amendment from this morning would be, uh, would solve the problem that we're doing. Now, the other question that uh, Senator Scheibel is asking is where does this leave the Oriental Medicine Board? Uh, and that is uh, probably uh, a consideration of another BDR that will be, or another bill that will be heard today. My goal, quite frankly, is for the division of business and industry to be able to uh, incrementally uh, assume all of the boards uh, and be able to have a, uh, a single place where someone will apply and then it will be uh, evaluated by those that are in the boards as they are now, but they will uh, be under a different structure. And so it will look more like uh, the Utah Department or Division of Professional Licensing. Um, and that will allow the boards not to have to figure out how to do their minutes, how to do all of the things that they haven't been real good at doing. Um, and so that's the rationale for the amendment this morning to make clear that the uh, licensees will not be shut out of the process of regulations, investigations, and making recommendations, but will be included uh, within the division in a structure that will be more clear when we look at uh, the effective date of January 1st, 2022, instead of immediately. If, if that helps, I'm not sure I've answered as many questions as I've caused. Uh, that, that does help, thank you. Thank you. Chair Spearman, this is uh, Mr. Reynolds, I'm on. Uh, I just wanted to say I concur with uh, uh, Senator Hardy's comments, and uh, we chose a later date so we would have time, uh, assuming the bill passes, to be able to meet with the uh, the occupational boards uh, that are in the legislation, as well as to work out budgetary items going forward. So we felt that January 1 would give us sufficient time to do that. Uh, wanted to make sure that we're meeting their needs going forward and that we have an understanding of, of how things are going to work. So that gives us the time to do that. And that's why I requested to move the uh, <clears throat> the date to January 1, 2022. Thank you. Additional questions? So, you know, I, I just have a couple of, couple of questions and I will um, share with you. I think the first time I heard um, term Oriental medicine, uh, I was really shocked. 
and I was shocked because um, every place I've ever been, Oriental now is considered a Georgia term. Uh, and so prior to um, Senator Hardy, prior to you getting uh, information and proposing this bill, it I was had, known as Oriental medicine I had, around yeah, Oriental. the world period. So, so here's the thing. Um, I had, and actually it'll come in another bill later on to propose to change the name because I thought that, I think that it is um, pejorative. And one of the things that concerns me, and I said this in uh, another session of Commerce and Labor, I think when we talked about uh, Oriental, me Oriental medicine, it's really, I guess, um, maybe East Asian medicine would probably be a better term for it. Uh, but to provide an alternative um, to some people who don't necessarily want to do the traditional Western medicine. Um, they were here in Nevada, they had an opportunity to uh, legalize acupuncture in 1973. Uh, that was groundbreaking then, but uh, the military is using it uh, now, or not the military, uh, well, the military and the VA are using it now. Uh, as part of the process to make sure that people who need treatment aren't necessarily given drugs um, at first um, first blush. So, um, I've, I've got I've got I've got an issue, and, and we talked about it, Senator Hart. I've got an issue about taking them out um, because it, in my mind, it 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 still suggests that there's only one type of uh, medicine. I'm willing to talk about it, and if there, if I got something wrong, then uh, I'm willing to listen uh, or whatever. But I just, um, I'm, I'm concerned that taking out what we call Oriental, which is pejorative, not another name for that type of medicine. Um, so I, I've got some concerns with that. Madam Chair, if I may, um, I, I. Uh... I understand, not only do I understand, but I think 335 will actually solve that problem because there will not be uh, a separate board called Oriental Medicine. There will not be a separate board called Board of Medical Examiners there eventually. In other words, all of the boards will be under the umbrella of the Division of Industry and we will not have to worry about uh, what a board is called as much as what the practitioners, the licensees do in the state of Nevada. So we won't have to worry about what a board is called as much as what the licensees do. And that is, I guess, one of the reasons why it's appealing uh, to have the big umbrella under the division of industry, because we won't have to worry about uh, what boards are called. They'll all be under the division of professional licensing as it were. So that is the ultimate goal, and this this uh, opportunity to do something uh, will mm -hmm. do something now and be able to uh, look at what the process is so that we can get the kinks out as we move forward. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that explanation. Um, I hear that and I see that in what you're trying to do. Um, I guess an overarching concern for me is that whenever you have a you have an entity that is different from whatever the majority is used to, and there is a process to assume that smaller entity into the larger entity, I'm concerned um, not just about their autonomy, but I'm concerned about uh, equity and fairness in the um, in the process. Um, we can have one board that just says medical or medical examiners or board of medicine. We could have one, um, but I am concerned that if it is not done in a way that acknowledges diversity and that acknowledges the value uh, that uh, this brand of medicine, Eastern medicine brings uh, to the table. And if, if in the process, um, what they do in terms of their craft and what they know how to do, uh, if that is whittled away, then in essence, the, um, the board has gone away too. Not, not just the board, not just the name, but everything that they do. And so, um, and, and I'll, just, I'll just say that, it, people are probably tired of hearing me say that this session, but um, I, I intend to keep saying it until we get it and until we start talking about it in realistic terms. 
uh, racism is a public health crisis, and it's not just racism from the standpoint of ethnicity, uh, how, how people have treated members of the Asian community with respect to COVID-19. It's ignorant, uh, and there's no basis in reality whatever, whatsoever for them to accuse someone who is of Asian descent uh, of bringing COVID into the country. But the fact remains, we have people who do not fully process in a reasonable way and, and, and whatever they come up with, their conclusion is completely untethered to reality uh, and completely untethered to any type of scientific fact. So my concern is if this happens, what happens to the identity and indeed the mission and what they know how to do? What 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 happens to that? And that that's that's a concern of mine. It's it you know it's it's kind of like this. You know somebody can say, well we'll we'll have let's have um, bacon and eggs, and that that sounds good. If you ask the chicken, yeah, I'm I'm cool. Chicken says, yeah, I'll, I'll give you some eggs. <laughs> pig they're like uh-uh the chicken just makes a contribution but i got to be fully committed so i want to make sure that if this is a process that we're going to move forward in and this has nothing whatsoever with whether or not um business and industry you know is a good place for it but i'm more concerned about what this means for this brand of uh medicine and the options that um people are moving away from a lot of the me the Western um, methods and moving over into uh, Eastern uh, medicine. That, that's just a long way around saying I've, I've still, most of the bill, 98% of the bill I like, I just really have a problem with this piece right here. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I'm not going to be able to allay all of your concerns but I can say that uh, Utah has probably been more uh, accepting uh, of uh, alternative medicine than many other people. When I talked with the uh, Board of Medical or the Board of Eastern Medicine, um, and that's what I'll call it, uh, it, it was a conversation that uh, was assuring that I would uh, be involved with making sure that the uh, practitioners were not left aside. And that's what led to the conceptual uh, amendment this morning that those people would be involved with evaluating the uh, uh, prowess and the ability and the uh, opportunities to do something that would be who else can uh, evaluate them but other people who practice that way. So the board, uh, the DOPL, the Division of Professional Licensing in Utah, for instance, involves the people who know what they're doing to evaluate other people who are applying for and licensed or for renewing. And so this is not to get rid of people as much as it is to include them in the big tent. And I think we have to have a big tent philosophy in the state of Nevada in order to be able to count everybody and enjoy everybody's talents. And that's where this is going if it's passed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And um, Senator Hardy, I, I appreciate that. I just want to make one more statement and probably a question too. Um, Utah has had some success. Uh, I don't know that the state of Utah has the uh, amount of diversity that we do in Nevada. And so again, my concern happens, if it happens, however it happens, it must happen through the lens of diversity, recognizing that there is more than one way for people to get well, and making sure that um, Eastern medicine is not uh, put in a subordinate place to Western medicine, but the value is accepted on par. Um, I don't know, and, and, and I have uh, every faith and confidence in, um, in Mr. Reynolds and, and what they do. Uh, I've got every faith and confidence in a lot of things. I just know that uh, when it comes to um, systemic racism, if we don't call it out and if we don't get a commitment from everyone who's going to be involved in whatever the changes are, we must get a commitment that uh, when you talk about something different, especially, especially 
in light of what uh, people of Asian descent in this country have gone through uh, in the last, I mean, all you have to do is just look at Atlanta, just in the, in the last month specifically, but in the last year especially. So um, I've got some concerns with that. I haven't really made up my mind which way I'm going to, to vote, but whichever way I vote, I will probably reserve my right to, to change my mind because I want us I want us to continue this. I need to make sure that uh, however this happens, that there is diversity in terms of diversity of thought, diversity of people who are, are going to look at this and to make sure that there is no subordination of Eastern medicine to Western medicine. Does that make sense to you? Oh, it it's absolutely makes sense. And I, I maintain that the big umbrella is more inclusive than little umbrellas. And I, I agree with you that we need everybody. I need everybody. I need Eastern, I need Western, I need chiropractors, I need physicians of every kind and ilk. And so I need nurses, I, I need them all. Nevada needs everybody. And if we can be invited, inviting more than uh, turning away, I think that is the mode that we have to be in. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, thank you. Um, and um, I'll see if there are any other questions. I know we've had this discussion before, and I know that uh, former Senator Parks and now Commissioner Sagerblum um, were big advocates for um, for this board. And some of the many of the things that they said, I ascribe to as well in terms of my philosophic out, philosophical outlook um, on medicine. So, um, committee members, additional questions. Comments? I'll accept a motion. Amended. Move to amend and do pass. I have an amend, a motion from Senator Settlemeyer. Do I have a second? Pickard, actually. I'm sorry, Senator Pickard. I keep trying to get back into the gallery view because I can't see you all in the. Senator Pickard has uh, given us a motion. Is that correct? Motion to amend, do pass. Do I have a second? Second. Second from Senator Lang. Further discussion? I'm Chair. Yes. This is Senator Settlemeyer. I'm concerned with the concept of taking 5% from all boards to go to administration, but I'm more concerned with the fact that I did a lot of work last session on the homeopathic board and having them go away troubles me when the reality is their problems been, we thought we had gotten corrected, but we really have no idea since unfortunately the governor's office hasn't appointed individuals to that board. So at this time, I'm kind of leaning towards no, I don't know, I'm still weighing it out, but I have concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comments or questions? I'm gonna, I'm gonna vote yes, Madam Chair, but reserve. Thank you. comments. Madam Secretary, please do a roll call vote. Senator Hardy. Yes. Senator Lang. Yes, and reserve my right. Senator Neal. Yes. Senator Pickard. Yes. Senator Scheibel. Yes. Senator Settlemeyer. No, with reservations. Chair Spearman. Yes, uh, and reserve my right to change my mind uh, because I still have concerns about the um, the diversity piece. So, but let the record show that the motion does carry. And Senator Hardy, would you like to take the floor statement on this? Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and so now let's move to um, Senate Bill 381. Mr. Magalejo. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senate Bill 381 uh, revises provisions relating to uh, certain businesses. 
and it was sponsored by this committee. It was heard uh, yesterday. Uh, we there is a, uh, a an amendment attached to this document that was submitted by uh, John Sandy from Argentum Partners. Um, in addition to these amendments, there is a, another proposed amendment uh, not included here. Uh, I would note that the amendment submitted by Mr. Mr. Sandy is to delete section one, uh, which revises exemptions from licensure and regulation as a deferred deposit, high interest or payday lender or as an installment lender. However, there is an additional proposed language that Mr. Herb Nelson uh, may review if the chair wishes to, uh, to hear that amendment. Uh, the, the following amendments, are, I'll begin with number two, is to amend subsection 4X1 uh, of section two to increase the initial fee for a provider of service contracts to $2,600. Uh, number three is to add a new section of the bill to define emergency service contract. Number four is to amend subsection two of section five to require a home service contract provider to respond to certain claims with 24 hours and to provide the consumers within 72 hours written procedures to expedite such claims. Number five is to amend subsection three of section five to expand the way a provider of home service contracts is required to communicate a denial of a claim for services. And number six is to amend subsection three of section seven to include that a home service provider may also deduct any claims paid by the provider during the current contract year. Number seven is to delete subsection four of section seven, which permits a service contract provider to refund a lender that has financed the purchase of a service contract. Number eight is to delete section eight of the bill, which authorizes the insurance mm -hmm. commissioner to make certain inquiries into the conduct of a her home service contract provider as the commissioner deems necessary. Number nine is to amend subsection one of section 12 to clarify the definition of a service contract. Number 10 is to amend subsection two of section 13 to include that the sale of a service contract to a third party does not constitute the business of insurance for the purpose of federal law. Number 11 is to delete subsection five of section uh, 16, which permits that a service contract provider to refund a lender that has been financed by the purchase of a service contract. Number 12 is to amend subsection 1Q of section 17 to require a service contract to, to providers to disclose that the home service contract is not an emergency service contract. And number 13 is to add a new section of the bill to require that advertisement sales and marketing materials for a home service contract that is not an emergency service contract must include a statement acknowledging that it is not a uh, a home service contract. Um, and Madam Chair, those were all the amendments except for the uh, proposed amendment by Mr. Nelson. So, Madam Chair. Yes, please. Uh, the proposed proposed amendment it happens to be where? Is this is this verbal? Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, this is a microphone for the record. That's correct. Uh. Wow. If if I may, the the vast majority of that amendment was actually uh, what I presented yesterday. Um, the only the only things that have changed from that amendment was uh, after discussions with the the Division of Insurance. Um, they had requested uh, from the original bill to delete sections eight. Um, and also sections seven uh, sub four and su sections 16 sub five, which we agreed to. Um, there was also in the hearing, um, uh, Senator Pickard had mentioned uh, that we removed that you could, uh, the, the word telephone, but that the exemption uh, for that was swallowed by uh, subsequent language. So we clarified that, that any denial has to be in a, any written and reproducible form. Um, and uh, there was just one other uh, that was the addition. So um, if you may recall from uh, the, we wanted to put a term in the contract uh, that, that stated that it was not an emergency service contract. Uh, the commissioner uh, of insurance wanted to go a little bit further than that. And so that was the section that said that any marketing material, uh, sales material, uh, also had to include that term. And so we were agreeable to that as well. And so those, from what was presented yesterday, those were, um, uh, and I just wanna make sure, uh, I believe those were the, the only uh, changes that, that were made from the, the amendment that was proposed yesterday. And I think that was John Sandy for the record. Oh, why, thank you very much. This is John Sandy for the record, my, my apologies. 
Madam Chair, this is Cesar Mugrejo, Community Policy Analyst. Uh, just to clarify, uh, all of the amendments submitted by, by Mr. Sandy are summarized on the work session document. So I, I guess, I don't know if my Nellist is not functioning the way that it's supposed to, but I only see the one exhibit, which is not your work session document. And so I think that's why I'm thrown off and I've checked and I've closed Nellis and then I've gotten back on. But in my exhibits, I have, I don't see your work session document. Madam Vice Chair, uh, this is Cesar Margarejo. You may need to refresh your page. Um, at this point, I just refreshed mine and I can see it, but I'm not sure if that would fix your, your issue. This is Joe Hardy. I, I, we're talking about Senate Bill 181. Senator Hardy, this is a, a Senate Bill 381. Thank you. Madam Vice Chair of the committee, uh, Mr. Keene just notified me that the work session document for SB 381 is under the exhibits tab and not the work session documents tab on Nellis. I, yeah, I just closed out uh, Nellis and then, um, and I see it now because I, I was literally like, I'm operating blind and Bill was going to die a fiery death. <laughs> Anyway. <laughs> Additional questions or comments? Thank you. Um, Mr. Sandy or, or um, Mr. Nelson, I'm not sure who can answer this, but um, we spoke a little about a little bit about section one yesterday. Uh, had some concerns, and I don't. I, I see that it has been um, it has been changed and been modified, but I still have some some issues about. I mean, I don't. I don't know if someone small business would wind up with a uh, a small loan that, and if the um, APR is forty percent, what was a small loan to save their business. Could be the loan that destroys their business. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm still not comfortable that that section one is still in there. Madam Chair, this is Cesar Mugrejo for the record. Mr. Sandy's amendment deletes section one. Okay, so I didn't see that. My bad. Section one is gone. Any additional questions? Madam Chair, I've been uh, resisting as much as I can, but uh, uh, my understanding of section one was, and maybe Mr. Nelson can speak to this, but uh, my understanding was section one was needed in order for commercial lenders to actually uh, uh, properly and legally lend in Nevada. Um, and uh, because the, 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 the way that the, uh, I mean, the language, the existing language is awkward uh, and uh, has created some unintended interpretations. And I think Mr. Nelson uh, uh, can speak to that. Madam, Madam Chair, can you hear me? Madam Chair? Hello? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, last last night, I, I spoke with uh, Bailey Bartolin and uh, the attorney who is working with her, Peter. I didn't catch his last name. And we discussed this issue. And they talked about the fact that 
their main concern is, as you know, small businesses which, and their owners. And so we discussed the possibility of making these, roam, these loans or these extensions of credit go out of the realm of what everybody would call, I guess, a small loan. And I proposed a number and uh, Ms. Bartlin, or Bartlin proposed another number and, and I actually accepted that on behalf of my client. And that would be to add just a couple of words saying that uh, where it says extend credit, just insert in the amount of $50,000 or more. And uh, she said that if we did that, that she would go from opposed to neutral. And that would, that would affect, affect the bill so that Nevada borrowers are not in a worse position than out-of-state borrowers. Uh, if, you know, if, if, the, if section one is not included in the amendment, then the statute will obviously remain the way it is. And what it will mean is that Nevada borrowers, if they decide they want it, they need this type of loan, will have to go out of state. But any other borrowers from any of the other 49 states can deal with a Nevada lender. And I think that that is, is not reasonable. And I think it's against the public policy of the state of Nevada to have credit available to borrowers if they decide that they need it for their business. Thank you. Senator Picker, your hand's still up. Was that for the last Sorry, one? Sorry, Madam Chair, yes, that's inadvertent. I forgot to take it down. Committee, additional questions or concerns? So, so I just want to be clear because I, so section one is not deleted. It is amended and folks will continue to work on section one post this hearing. That's that's what I'm trying to get clarity on. Yes, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, I will be happy to work with any interest holders, any stakeholders and get something that everybody can live with. Thank you. Irv Nelson for the record. Additional questions, comments? So Mr. Nelson and Mr. Sandy, I'm I'm not of the mind to limit opportunities for small businesses to grow. Uh, I think if we can continue to work on um, section one, I'm just trying to make sure that there's a type of con consumer protections in place. Um, I just want to make sure that there's some type of consumer protections in place, especially coming out of this pandemic. And there have been so many people who have been hurt and so many small businesses uh, that are still struggling. Um, but I just want to make sure that we have the, um, to the extent possible, we have the right type of consumer protections in place. Um, and I, I trust that we can continue this discussion until it comes up for a floor vote. Uh, Irv Nelson, Madam Chair, uh, to the extent you need a response, absolutely. I look forward to that and uh, will make myself available anytime. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Neal. I think uh, Mr. I don't know if he wants to say anything, but I think there's not clarity on what exactly is the change, right? Like what, what the work is on, can we get the amended language restated of what is supposed to be done? Madam Chair, uh, if I may, uh, uh, I was going to uh, jump in and make a motion. And so I think maybe I can clarify that in the motion. Um, uh, I would move that we uh, amend and do pass 
uh, and the amendments would include all of Mr. Sandy's amendments except for the deletion of section one and instead to uh, amend it uh, pursuant to Mr. Nelson's uh, adjusted language. Does that make sense? Uh, his adjusted language is not written, right? It's verbal. So I think he needs to, that needs to be restated on what is the verbal language that we're agreeing to. I'm sorry, I'm with you. Yes, I agree. And, and let me just interject because he mentioned that he had a conversation with uh, Ms. Bordelain and there was the number that they agreed on. So whatever that conversation was and whatever that was that they agreed on, I think that should be in the amendment uh, and it should be explicit. To make uh, Irv Nelson for the record, uh, Madam Chair. So, are you saying that you want the okay? You want the contents of our discussions yesterday to be in writing. You don't want them in the language of the bill, but you want me to explain what we talked about and and what we agreed to last night. Not necessarily the conversation. I just need to know what the agreement was uh, that takes care of some of my concerns and I guess some other committee members concerns. So um, I don't, I don't, I don't need the full um, context of everything that you said. I just need to know, you said you all, you talked to her and you all came to an agreement on something. And I think whatever that something is that you all came to an agreement on should be uh, present in the, um, in the amendment. And maybe I'm overlooking it. Okay. Uh, we got a lot of amendments in here the last minute and was trying to get through them before the meeting started, um, but I didn't. So I've been kind of cheating going back and forth. Uh, this is Herb Nelson, Your Honor. Uh, I'm sorry, Your Honor, Madam Chair. Uh, to the extent I'm I can- I'm honorable. I'm honorable, so it's okay. You you are honorable and I and I have joy, enjoyed watching you the last two days and seeing you again. Uh, I'm used to appearing before judges, but anyway, Madam Chair, what we agreed on was that this exemption would only apply to loans of $50,000 or more to hopefully get it out of the realm of, you know, smaller businesses and, uh, and their owners. And we, we talked about the fact that there are so many people who, you know, fall into that category. In fact, I do, you know, I left a hundred man law firm and I'm, sole practitioner now. So I'm a small business person and I have those same concerns. And uh, Ms. Bordelin, Ms. Bordelin and I went back and forth on numbers and she stood firm on $50,000. And so I said, fine, we'll, we'll go to $50,000. So any loan under that is not protected by the exemption. That's the intent. Thank you. So Mr. Nelson, can you propose language right now for us? Yes, let me pull up. Okay, so I'm looking at 16 the way I, I received it. Obviously the, the, the red stricken out language I would like to have stricken out. And then, so it would read, a person who exclusively extends credit to any person, and then add this language, in an amount of $50,000 or more. And then we pick up with what's left in this statute for any business comma commercial or agricultural purpose. And then another few words I had proposed a few days ago would be at the end of that comma, regardless of personal guarantees or collateral period. And we discussed yesterday the fact that in I'd say 99% of the commercial loans I've ever seen, there are personal guarantees. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that. And so Madam Chair, that would be my motion. So that's your motion. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, second from Senator Hardy. Uh, further discussion? 
Uh, Madam Vice Chair, uh, does that suffice um, for allay your concerns? I just wanted to make sure there was, we were clear on what changing, what we're voting on so that um, we could have a clear record. And um, I think I'm in a weird space right now because I'm like, if it's unclear, I'm not voting on it, right? And and so I needed that if anybody wants me to vote on anything. Additional comments, concerns? Madam Secretary, please do a roll call vote. Senator Hardy? Yes. Senator Lang? Yes. Senator Neal? Yes. Senator Pickard? Yes. Senator Scheibel? Yes. Senator Settlemeyer? Yes. Chair Spearman? Yes. And let the motion, let the record show that the motion does carry. Uh, does pass and um, Senator Pickard, you want to take this floor statement? Happy to, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Thank you. Enjoyed serving with you when you were in this body. Thank you. I feel the same way, and I, I really enjoyed your, your words yesterday. If it's not inappropriate to say it, Madam Chair, about the. Uh, the spouses of veterans and I, I really appreciate your passion and if I were there I'd vote with you on that. <laughs> Thank you. I wish I were with you, but the voters did something else. So I enjoy watching everybody again. Thank you. Thank you. You understand. And I meant every word of that. So Mr. Magorejo, I think I uh called a bill that was out of order. So tell me and I just see that um Ms. Douglas is going to have to go at about at 10. So why don't we take another uh, small bill? I think 402 may be one of those ones that we uh, banter about uh, for a little while. So um, let's take a smaller bill, one that won't be uh, as controversial. Uh, Madam Vice, uh, Madam Chair, Cesar McGrejo for the record. I will take uh, Senate Bill 276 uh, next, which is uh, which imposes a technology fee for the issuance of or renewal of certain licenses, certificates, permits, and, and registrations issued by the Real Estate Division of the Department of Business and Industry. And there were no amendments to this measure. Committee questions, comments. I'll entertain a motion. So moved. I have a motion from Senator Lang. Do I have a second? Second. Second from Vice Chair Neal. Further discussion? Madam Chair. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I uh, uh, certainly agree with my colleagues in the industry that we need the uh, division to get up to date in their technology. I think given the amount of money that's flowing to the state, uh, they could be used in one shots. Uh, I think that uh, uh, the desire when we heard the uh, testimony from the realtors that they bought the fee, I think uh, the way I interpreted that was they want the improvements, uh, but I don't think the fee is necessary. So I'll be a no on this. Additional comments? I, 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 think, I think we've seen what happens when we don't invest the money in uh, technology before it's needed, um, which is why we got ourselves in such a deep hole with people not being able to, where Dieter was not able to really process um, all the claims uh, because of the antiquated system. 
and that is a direct consequence of the fact that we did not appropriate the money uh, to bring it up to date. So um, I think in in times like this, uh, there's nothing else that we've learned, and that is to make sure that we are prepared technologically uh, for the worst So and, and hope for the best so that if the worst happens, we are there. And um, this time we weren't prepared, and there were several um, thousand people because they didn't have the technology who uh, were unable to get their unemployment checks on time. Um, Madam Chair, I could not agree more with you. I, I completely agree with that. And my concern is if we rely strictly on the technology fee, then uh, according to uh, Director uh, Chandra, uh, it'll take four years or so for them to have enough money in the account to do the technology uh, upgrades. And so I think it would be far more appropriate to do a one-shot appropriation with the money that's coming in. Uh, and then uh, get them up to speed quickly rather than wait four years and wait for the uh, licensees themselves to uh, fully fund that. Uh, I agree that uh, it's the uh, example of Dieter and how we didn't appropriate enough money. Uh, and given that uh, this is an account that isn't that, that they can continue to dip into, it will probably take longer than four years. And who knows what the next uh, crisis will bring uh, uh, and so you pinpointed exactly why I think the technology fee is the, the uh, it's a great intention. Uh, we need the uh, technology upgrades, but we need to do it now. Uh, we, we shouldn't be waiting. So uh, I appreciate your comment. Thank you. Madam Chair. Senator Hardy here. Yes, sir. Hi, Senator Hardy here. I, I concur with both of you. I think we need to do an investment now, but likewise, it's been my impression that four years from now, three years from now, two years from now, there's gonna be a new software, there's gonna be a new gizmo or gadget that we're going to need. And I would uh, agree that we need to invest now as well as have an ongoing uh, investment in the upgrading that's going to happen invariably and uh, for sure. So I will be voting yes for this. Thank you. Thank you. Additional concerns? Thank you. Um, it is my hope that uh, Senate Bill 110 will help address some of this too, and that's the one with the task force to um, look at emerging technology. And so perhaps once that's once that passes and, we, and it is implemented, we can look at ways that um, we can make sure that it's funded. If there are no more questions or comments. Uh, Madam Secretary, please do a roll call. I have a, a motion by Senator Picker and a second that Senator Lang. Yes. No, Madam Chair. Uh, no, I don't... Motion by no, no Vice, Chair, Vice Chair Neal. Vice Chair Neal. Got you. I'm looking. It looked like Senator Lang was bobbing her head. Okay. All right. Somebody made the motion. We had a second. So, Madam Secretary, please call. <laughs> Do a roll call. It's kind of hard when you got like four and a half hours of sleep. So, anyway. Senator Hardy? Yes. Senator Lang? Yes. Senator Neal? Yes. Senator Scheibel? Yes. Senator Settlemeyer? No with reservations. Was that yes with reservations? No, no with reservations. Thank you. Chair Spearman? Yes. Uh, let the record show that the motion does carry. Um, and just before we get into the next one, I just want to say a real big thank you to our staff who were here as late. And I think uh, Terry was, might have been later than I last night trying to make sure that we got all of the amendments and all the changes done. So uh, big shout out to you all above and above, beyond the call of duty. So with that, thank you. Rejo, let us proceed. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'll just move up to the top of the, the list of bills uh, to Senate Bill 260. 
Uh, Senate Bill 260 revises provisions relating to internet privacy. It was sponsored by Senator Canizaro uh, and Matt Robinson from Argentum Partners proposes the following conceptual amendments, uh, which are attached to this work session document. So the first amendment is to amend section two to delete the reference to dissemination and to clarify that a data broker is a person whose primary business is the purchase of covered information. Number two is to amend sections 10 and 11 to delete provisions that reduce from 30 days to 10 days the amount of time that an operator is authorized to remedy a failure of, of providing a consumer a notice containing certain information relating to the collection and sale of covered information. Number three is to add a new section to the bill to amend subsection two of Nevada Revised Statutes 603A.330 to exempt from the definition of operator a person who does not collect, store, or sell covered information. Uh, number four is to amend subsections one and two of section 11 to remove willfully and simply leave knowingly as the standard for a violation of the requirement uh, to provide a notice containing certain information relating to the collection and sale of covered information. And number five is to add a new section to the bill to exempt the following organizations and information from the provisions of this bill, which are the Fair Credit Reporting and Fraud Prevention Organizations, uh, publicly available data and information and data process pursuant to Federal uh, Drivers Privacy and Prevention Act. Uh, Madam Chair, this is for all the amendments. Thank you. Uh, committee, questions or comments? Thank you. So I will entertain a motion to amend to pass. So move, Senator Scheibel. Second. I think you're on mute. You did. have a motion from Senator Scheibel and a second from, is that uh, Senator Settlemeyer? Correct. All right, thank you. Further discussion? Questions? Thank you, Madam Secretary, please do a roll call vote. Senator Hardy? Yes. Senator Lang? Yes. Senator Neal? Yes. Senator Pickard? No. Senator Scheibel? Yes. Senator Settlemeyer? Yes. Chair Spearman? Yes. And with that, uh, let the record show that the motion does carry, and I will ask Majority Leader Canzaro to take the floor statement on that. Uh, I'm looking at the time now, and so that we have enough time to vet 402 while uh, Ms. Uh, Douglas is here. Um, Mr. Melarejo, will you please bring up 402, and we will um, do that next on our agenda. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Cesar Melarejo, Committee Policy Analyst. Uh, Senate Bill 402 revises provisions relating to regulatory bodies and sponsored by this committee and it was heard yesterday. Uh, Senator Spearman proposes the following conceptual amendments which is to add a new section of the bill to revise uh, to authorize the State Board of Oriental Medicine to examine whether and how to change the name of the board and submit recommendations uh, for the next legislative session. Number two is to amend subsection one of section two to remove the State Board of Nursing from the requirement uh, to enter into reciprocal licensing agreements. And number three is to amend subsection two of section 245 to clarify that rather than actually using the licenses, the commission uh, issuing the licenses, the Commission of Professional Standards and Education adopts regulations governing the issuance of a license. And those are all the amendments. <clears throat> Thank you. Committee, questions? Comments? Madam Chair. Uh, yes, Is that Senator Hardy. So I, I look at the State Board of Western or of Eastern Medicine being able to do what they need to do before January 1st, 2022. So I don't see this as a conflict with the prior bill that was discussed. So I am supportive of uh, the bill. Thank you. 
Question, Neil. So I had a question on the the nursing amendment and uh, them not doing the reciprocal licenses, but that's not applying to any other group. Why 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 nurse carve out? We were trying to get some. Uh, this is Senator Smith for the record. Trying to uh, get some um, agreement as to some of the protections. And we were not able to arrive at a good compromise in time. So the conversation will continue. Madam Chair, if I may. Yes, sir. Uh, the State Board of Nursing is probably one of the most exemplary boards we have in the state of Nevada. And uh, so obviously uh, I would use them as an example for any board as well as any way that we're moving forward uh, with any massive umbrella. They have done a great job and have been very good at what they do. Thank you. Especially during the pandemic. Thank you. Additional questions, concerns? Madam Chair, I would just point out that uh, the Board of Nursing already has portability within their licensure. Um, they're doing uh, 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 the uh, military spouse uh, accelerated reviews already. Um, so uh, I too am supportive of the bill as amended. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any other hands raised. Uh, Madam Secretary, please do a roll call vote. Madam Chair, motion. Madam I'm Chair, sorry, motion. Motion. I'll make the motion to amend and do pass. Second. Uh, Motion from Senator Pickard, second from Senator Hardy. Further discussion? Madam Secretary, now let's do a roll call vote. Senator Hardy? Yes. Senator Lang? Yes. Senator Neal? Yes. Senator Pickard? Yes. Senator Scheibel? Yes. Chair Settle, uh, excuse me. Senator Sedelmeyer. <laughs> watch it, watch it. <laughs> that's not even a prophecy, okay? <laughs> no, that's a flashback. Senator Sedelmeyer. Yes. Yeah. Chair Spearman. Oh, thank you. With all due respect to my, uh, my colleague, um, that's probably not a flashback. That's probably my worst nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just a little levity, Senator Sotomayor. You know, you cool with me, right? Correct. <laughs> okay. All righty. So um, I will take uh, this floor statement on 402. And Ms. Douglas, thank you for taking some time out to be with us this morning. Appreciate it. And I think we got you out of here in time to get to your next appointment. Thank you so much. Good. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Melorejo, coming up next. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, for the record, Cesar Melorejo, Committee Policy Analyst. I will move on to Senate Bill 293 uh, next. Uh, Senate Bill 293 revises provisions relating to employment. It was sponsored by Senator Canazaro. Uh, Senator Canazaro proposes the following conceptual amendments is to add a new section to the bill modeled on Nevada Revised Statutes 613.412 to authorize a person who believes that he or she has been discriminated against an employer's inquiry into his or her wage or, or salary history to request a right to sue notice from the Labor Commissioner. Second Amendment is to delete Section 2 of the bill, which indicates the employers, affect, employers affected by this bill Instead, add a new provision to Section 1 to, of the bill to define an employer for the purposes of Section 1. And uh, number three is to delete Section 6 and 7 of the bill so that it is clear that the Labor Commissioner, not the Nevada Equal Rights Commission, enforces Section 1 as provided in subsection 5 of Section 1. Number four is to amend Sections 1 and 9 through 12 to require the employer to disclose the salary range or wage rate to an applicant under certain circumstances. And the last amendment is to delete subsection two of sections one and nine through 12, 
which provides that an applicant is not prohibited from voluntarily voluntarily disclosing their wage or salary, and an employer is not prohibited from using the voluntary disclosed information to determine the rate of pay of the applicant. And Madam Chair, that's all the amendments. Thank you. Um, committee, questions or comments? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion. Amend your pass. Men do pass. I have a motion from Senator Hardy. Do I have a second? Second, Senator Scheibel. I have a second from Senator Scheibel for the discussion. Seeing none, Madam Secretary, please do a roll call vote. Senator Hardy? Yes. Uh, Senator Lang? Yes. Senator Neal? Yes. Senator Pickard? No. Senator Scheibel? Yes. Senator Settlemeyer? No. Chair Spearman? Yes. And let the record show that the motion does pass. And I'll give this again to our um, Senate Majority Leader. And um, she's got a lot of these. Um, coming up, so she very well may um, delegate to someone else. Um, so let's make sure that we know who's going to take the floor statement, but for right now, we'll, uh, I'll ask Senator Canizaro if she'll take it. And with that, Mr. Magalejo. Madam Chair. Yes, sir. I apologize. On We just did 293, and I had the wrong uh, section. I'm actually yes on, one, on that one. They took the amendment that I had requested, so I apologize. If you could record me as a yes on that one. I'm sorry. Noted. We'll, we'll resend the no vote and you're actually yes, correct? Correct. Thank you. So the motion passes um, and we'll ask a uh, majority leader to take the floor statement on that. Okay. Mr. Magarejo. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair from Cesar Magarejo for, uh, for the record. Uh, our next bill is Senate Bill 295, which revises provisions relating to industrial insurance. And it was, again, sponsored by Senator Canizaro, and it was heard on April 2nd. Uh, Mr. Uh, Todd Inglesby, uh, President of Professional Firefighters of Nevada, proposes the following amendment. The amendment is to amend subsection 4 of section 2 of the bill to limit the application of the bill only to compensation paid to certain professionals primarily firefighters, police officers, and arson investigators for a disability related to lung disease, heart disease, and hepatitis. And those are all the amendments. Thank you, committee members. Any questions, comments? Madam Chair, uh, amend your pass. Uh, that's Senator Lang. I have a motion from Senator Lang to amend. Yes, it's me. That was you, right? Yes. Okay. <coughs> motion from Senator Lang to amend to pass. Do I have a second? And Senator Scheibel. Second from Senator Scheibel for the discussion. Madam Secretary, please do a roll call vote. Senator Hardy? Yes. Senator Lang? Yes. Senator Neal? Yes. Senator Pickard? Yes. Senator Scheibel? Yes. Senator Settlemeyer? Yes. Chair Spearman? Yes. Thank you. And I'll let the record show that the motion does carry. Uh, and again, I will assign this to um, Senator Canizaro or her designee. So, Mr. Magarejo, we're on, we're up next on, was it 307? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. Uh, Cesar Magarejo, Committee Policy Analyst. Senate Bill 307 uh, revises provisions relating 
Related to the sale of alcoholic beverages is sponsored by Senator Don Darrell Loop and was heard on April 6, 2021. Uh, to the members and to the chair, there is a new amendment that was submitted just a couple of minutes ago. It is uploaded to Nellis. You may have to refresh your page to be able to see it, um, but it's labeled as SB 307 proposed amendment uh, from Nevada wholesalers. And uh, Mr. Alfredo Alonzo submitted the amendment um, as well as the, the initial amendment attached to this work session document. Uh, from my, just from a quick uh, review of the amendment, I believe that the, uh, the new amendment on Nellis will delete uh, subsection one of section two, uh, which provides that a supplier may not discriminate between wholesalers uh, in this state uh, with, res with, with respect to uh, freight charges. Um, the next amendment, which is the, still remains the same as uh, what's included in the work session document, is to amend uh, subsection 9 of section 3 to prohibit a supplier from requiring a wholesaler to keep a, a minimum recovery, a minimum inventory of the supplier's alcoholic beverages or other items that exceeds the number of days uh, credit, uh, number of days credit extended to the wholesaler by the supplier. And number three is to amend subsection 3E of section four to clarify the, uh, the language which provides that the additional 20,000 barrels of malt beverages manufactured by a person who operates one or more brew pubs must be sold to a wholesaler located outside of the state. Uh, Madam Chair, I believe uh, Mr. Alfredo Alonso and uh, the sponsor, Senator Dunder Loop, are on Zoom, which can clarify any questions. Committee. Any questions? I see Senator Settlemeyer. Senator Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the discussion and the deletion. Uh, so we're getting rid of the language under Section 2 that it was changed to unjustified distinction. So that just goes away. So that way we're not uh, trying to figure out freight charges in that respect in the bill anymore. I just wanted to get that clear on the record that Section 2 is now not being changed. Uh, Marilyn Dondero Loop for the record. Um, we have deleted uh, um, in the actual bill, if you look at lines, uh, section two, page four, uh, lines eight and nine, including without limitation with respect to price or freight charges. After some discussion late last night and early this morning, uh, that was amended. I appreciate that. Uh, Thank you, Senator. Senator I, I appreciate that very much. The, the reason I'm having time following it is we're looking at an amendment we just got minutes ago. And of course, it doesn't have the same page numbers and the same line numbers as you because there are no line numbers Correct. on uh, the one we're looking at. So I just wanted to make sure that was on the record. The last thing I had to do uh, that would give me comfort and allow me to vote for the bill is changing section seven. Why don't we just change section seven to state that individuals have the right, Nevada businesses, small businesses, in the state of Nevada have the right to ship up to a gallon within the state. Because as you're leaving the bill as it is now, you're allowing Wine of the Month Club to ship into this state. So why not give the same rights to Nevadans? Thank you very much, Marilyn Dondero Loop for the record. Senator Settlemeyer, thank you for that suggestion. Um, as I mentioned, um, we had some late night and very early morning discussions. And I know that you had some angst about the freight and, uh, and pricing. And so that's why that was deleted along with a couple of their members. Um, I had not heard um, your entire bill hearing yesterday, um, but uh, I'm happy to take that back um, to the parties that I'm working with. I appreciate that. For now, then I'll, I'll be a no unless we can somehow make sure that Nevada businesses are at least on the same foothold as California, Utah, and other businesses. Thank you. Mr. Neal. Yeah, thanks, Madam Chair. I, I had a question on because I'm trying to. So the Second Amendment, which is the Wholesalers Amendment. Can, can we get a little bit more conversation around section three? I believe it's section three sub nine. 
Marilyn Dondero Loop for the record. Thank you, Senator Neal. Um, I would um, refer that question to either Mr. Alonzo or Mr. Reed, who are both on the line with me. Thank you. Madam Chair, I, I'd be glad to, to uh, answer any questions. I, I believe uh, Mr. Reed is on the line as well. He'd probably be better versed on this than I, but I can give it a shot. Um, so go direct, don't go through me, just go direct when you answer the questions, okay? Okay. So, so yeah, I'm trying to get clarity. I mean, so you go from days to exceeding the number of days of credit extended to the wholesaler by supplier. And then you have required the wholesaler to keep minimum inventory of the supplier's alcoholic beverages or other it, it, items. The attempt here, Senator, is to clarify that if a uh, supplier is requiring a number of days of inventory, that credit would uh, follow that as well. So in other words, if the requirement is for 10 days of inventory, the wholesaler would get 10 days of credit uh, in terms of payment on that inventory. Uh, that's That was the attempt to make that as simple as possible. Uh, um, and, and, but that is the, that is the uh, intent of the, of the uh, amendment is to clarify it. that again, it's only based on inventory that's required of a wholesaler. So these changes, because this was the this was the latest amendment that got worked on by the parties, is this is this now? How, what did this? Because there was opposition. So where where are you guys at in this process of agreement with this latest Monday morning? Well, it's not even Monday. It's Friday. Marilyn John Darrell Loop for the record. Senator Neal, I'll just jump in there. Um, after hearing that there was some angst um, last night, late, I got up this morning and I called both parties um, and uh, I asked if taking, uh, they told me that uh, taking 2.1 or 3.9 out is what they wanted. I said, I'm happy to delete 2.1. Um, that was half of what they asked. Um, there has been a lot of discussion. I have listened to both sides. And so um, unless Mr. Alonzo has something else to ask, I can all, or answer, add, I can only tell you from my standpoint, I have had discussions and I have had um, several discussions this morning with um, the uh, opposing um, party. Okay, thank you, uh, Senator. Senator, I would only add that uh, that Senator Dondero had contacted me. Um, um, I would I would tell you that not not all of uh, the the folks in my camp are happy. Um, clearly, this is an important piece of of uh, of the bill for us. Uh, but uh, as she indicated, uh, you don't always uh, get everything you want, and and uh, I've advised them to accept it. Thank you, um, Senator Pickert. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I'm in the same boat. Uh, we, we've not had time to really digest this, uh, let alone hear from the two sides. And as I said in the original uh, hearing, I feel like a parent uh, trying to referee two squabbling kids. But it, interestingly enough, last night I spoke to the third child that wasn't heard from. I was talking to one of the local retailers um, who uh, expressed it, and it, I was surprised at his knowledge of the discussion. People are paying attention to this, and they suggested that if the, the uh, um, suppliers uh, who are not going to just absorb, uh, he didn't believe that they're just going to absorb freight costs, and we heard in the testimony that 
part of the problem is, you know, logistics, the, the uh, suppliers will ship a truckload, not multiple truckloads. Uh, and so there'll be increased costs. Um, uh, I don't think this resolves that. So I'd be surprised if the uh, uh, suppliers came up, but the retailers suggested that uh, no matter what happens, the suppliers aren't going to absorb the cost. The wholesalers aren't going to absorb the cost. So it's the local guy who ends up footing the bill. Um, now, I don't know how much of that is accurate. Uh, I just don't know enough about this industry because I don't purchase the, the stuff. Um, I don't deal with this on a, a legal basis. Um, uh, but, you know, I was really persuaded by the retailer who said, you know, this is ultimately going to raise our prices and uh, they're trying to recover. And so to the extent that they expressed to me a desire to, uh, you know, just kind of hold tight and let's let the market resolve this uh, so that it doesn't result in a, uh, um, a, uh, 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 an increase to their prices. I mean, that resonated. And then now that we're looking at the revisions to sub nine, and now we're telling the suppliers to issue credit. I get really nervous when we're starting to tell businesses that they have to take credit from somebody uh, without giving them the ability to manage their risk. Um, so, you know, I, I, but to the extent that, you know, the, the, uh, um, uh, the, the suppliers are the big gorillas in the room and uh, can kind of throw their weight around. And, and it's the local wholesalers and the retailers that end up taking the, the brunt of that, uh, or at least that's the argument that's been made. I'm sensitive to that too. But at the end of the day, I don't see how this um, amendment really addresses the, the spat that's at the core of this uh, in a way that uh, has gotten both sides on board uh, I don't see them as diametrically opposed in their positions. So as a mediator, I'm of the opinion that there's a re resolution to be found. Um, I just don't know that uh, changing the law to get there uh, without a healthy uh, uh, debate uh, is really the way to do it. And we just got the amendment literally minutes ago. Um, I just, I'm not comfortable. So I'm gonna go with my gut and I'm gonna have to, to vote no. Uh, with uh, a reservation to change my uh, uh, vote on the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> I, I've heard arguments both ways. Um, I, I don't think this is yet soup. Um, so I'm, I'm going to vote no with the reserve the right to change my vote. And I would even change my vote in committee if it, if my no vote prevented this from going forward. I think we need to have the discussions in a way that uh, clarifies so that we come together. So I'm going to vote no with the reserve the right to change my vote even within the committee if it doesn't move it forward. Thank you. Madam, Madam Chair. Yes, ma'am. I know that uh, uh, Senator Dondero Loop has worked hard and this has been a stress for her. Um, I'm gonna vote yes with the reservation um, to change my vote. I think that um, the parties are in a very unique position and um, and I think that, you know, it's it's been a short time window to try to find consensus, but this is the best that it's gonna happen at this moment today. So I, I will support the work of Senator Don Darrell Loop as she continues to find a way. Madam Chair. I think she's frozen. Madam Chair. Is she? <coughs> go, go ahead, Senator Lang. I don't know what happened. So, um, Madam Chair, Senator Lang, for the record, um, I too thank Senator Dondero Lee um, for all the work that she's done 
I um, know that um, there are, are people in the industry that are still opposed to this bill and feel like they'd like to come to the table and have conversations. I know it's been a long road for everyone involved. And, um, but I too agree with uh, Senator Neal, Vice Chair Neal, that um, we're at the best place we can be for today, that we should get this out of committee. And um, I reserve my right, I'm gonna vote yes, and I reserve my right to change my mind. But I think those conversations need to happen um, before this comes to the floor. And it would be better for all of us sitting here today for the parties to come with a resolution that everyone could agree with, because I think that, um, you know, um, I think everyone has their idea maybe about what should happen, but I, I, I trust and believe in the sponsor of the bill and uh, the parties that they will be able to come up with some kind of resolution. So um, with that, Madam Chair, I would uh, make a motion that we amend and do pass. Madam Vice Chair, uh, this is Cesar Magrejo, Community Policy Analyst. Uh, looks like the chair got kicked out of Zoom. She's trying to log back on now. Okay. If we might need to take a small recess. Okay, hello. Hello, Madam Chair. Hello, Madam Chair. Can you all hear me? Madam Chair, we can hear you now. Okay, yeah, I got, um, something happened and the internet went out and um, so when I started talking and just as I started talking, the internet went out. So uh, let me finish my point. Yeah, let, let, me, let me finish my point. Uh, my point was that we have, um, there were two, two sides that had very persuasive arguments uh, or positions. Okay, here we go. This one, that one, okay. Uh, which camera am I looking at? Camera two? Okay. <laughs> so um, both both sides had, had uh, very compelling um, points to consider. And I had an opportunity to talk with uh, a couple of folks from both sides so I could kind of chew this around. And um, I think I'm, I, I will support this uh, because I think this is probably, uh, at least for right now, uh, the best that we can do. And if we can do better, then uh, there'll be an opportunity to try that uh, once it gets out of committee and um, you all can continue to talk. But I think um, I think the late night and early morning um, efforts by Senator Tondero Loop uh, have been laudable. And uh, so with that, I don't know if uh, Vice Chair had you already started taking uh, doing a motion. Um, yeah, amend and amend and do pass. Um, okay, I'm smiling. I got my mask on, so you can't see it, but I'm smiling. So we have. Chair, that I didn't amend and do pass. <laughs> Chair, Chair Spearman, <laughs> Senator yes. Lang, uh, Chair, Senator Lang had made the motion to amend and do pass. Okay, uh, so we have a motion from Senator Lang. Do I have a second? Second. A second from... From Vice Chair Neal. Okay, second from Vice Chair Neal. Um, additional discussion? Madam Chair. Yes, I think that's Senator Settlemeyer. Correct, Chair. I appreciate the work that's been done. I hope to continue to work with the idea of trying to actually help the smaller Nevada businesses that exist that are the distillers, the craft brewers, and the wineries that are in the state of Nevada by looking at the gallon limitation and changing that. But there, the reality is this bill will only increase price as it has done in other states. And at this time, I don't want to increase price on my consumers. Thank you. I'll be voting now. Thank you, Senator. Yeah, Yes, that's Senator Hardy. Yes. So the the thing that I realize is that because of all of the differences that are coming up and have come up and have been discussed and have been vetted and some not vetted totally, I think this isn't yet soup. I will be voting no, but if it requires my yes vote to get it out of committee, I will switch my vote. And no matter which vote I do, I reserve the right to change it on the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. 
Additional questions? I just, Comments? I just want to make sure that um, I think, so you have a, I was a yes with the reservation to change, but to get it out. So I know you had um, technical difficulties. Did you have your question answered or no? I don't think it's, this is one of these impossible bills, Chair. So um, we just need to roll with this and let Senator Don Darrow loop keep working. Okay, and so with that, um, Madam Secretary, let's do a roll call vote. Senator Hardy? No. Senator Lang? Yes, and I reserve my right. Senator Neal? Yes. Senator Pickard? No, with reserving my right. Senator Scheibel? Yes. Senator Settlemeyer? No, without an amendment to help small businesses. Chair Spearman? Uh, I'll be a yes for now, but I'll reserve the right. I think there's some more things to that they can accomplish, but I'll be a yes for now. So with that, um, the motion passes. And uh, Senator John Darrell Luke, can we give you the uh, floor statement? Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, let's take a um, let's take a ten minute um, recess, and let's figure out what's going on with the internet over here in the office, uh, so I don't look like I'm in the witness protection program. Uh, <laughs> so we'll come back. We'll come back in about ten minutes. Okay. Uh, so we're in recess.
Chair, the broadcast is ready and you may call the meeting back to order once you're ready. We doke. Thank you. Hi there, and we're back from recess. Uh, I think we got all the gremlins out and we are ready to proceed. The last bill we did was uh, 307, and uh, I think we gave it to Senator, the floor statement Senator Don Darrell Loop. So let's now move to Senate Bill 308. Uh, and <clears throat> Mr. Marrejo, before we move there, one of the things I was saying when when the uh, uh, system went down is uh, I think everybody who's who's worked with me since I've been in the Senate knows that I don't like winners and losers. I always like people to come together and see where they can find a compromise. Um, and so it's going to be real important um, to it's going to be real important to continue working with uh, Senator Don Darrell Loop. Let's see what we can come up with. Um, and that was the purpose for my resolution. I mean, see what else they can come up with um, to get to go. So with that, Mr. Marejo, let's go on to Senate Bill 308. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Cesar Mogrejo, Committee Policy Analyst. Uh, Senate Bill 308 provides for the establishment of a work sharing program and is sponsored by Senator Don Darrell Loop. Uh, Senator Don Darrell Loop proposes the following conceptual amendments as to add a new section to the bill to make the provisions of Section 11, which require the administrator to establish and maintain a work sharing program effective only to the extent that funding is available. And the second amendment is to amend the effective date of the bill uh, to be upon passage and approval for purpose of performing preparatory administrative tasks and on July 1, 2022 for all other purposes. And Madam Chair, that's all the amendments. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> committee members, uh, questions or comments? I don't see any, so I will entertain a motion. I move amendment to pass, Senator Scheibel. I have a motion from Senator Scheibel. Do I have a second? Second. Second from Vice Chair Neal. Further discussion? I'm sorry, Madam Chair, which one are we on? We're on 308. Okay, did, does uh, Mr. Magorejo need to read it again? You got it in your work session? Sorry, uh, Madam Chair. No, uh, I've read the uh, um, uh, the uh, work session document. Um, I, I'm not convinced. I, I'm, I'm of the opinion that we should not allow uh, the expansion of services until they get their core mission uh, 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 fixed. Uh, this doesn't resolve the problems that, in fact, it, it has a, a potential to uh, make it a little more difficult uh, to resolve some of the problems. So I'll be a no on this. Thank you. Additional questions or concerns? Anyone else? Um, I think Dita's on the line, but I, I'll just say this is how I understand it. Um, this is the one where instead of laying off three people, if you can do some work sharing, that that happens. Is that correct, Senator Dondero Loop? Yes, ma'am, it is. Uh, yes, uh, Madam Chair, it is. Um, and you are correct. Uh, Dieter is on the line for questions. Okay. Um, so here, here's, here's my question. And let me see if I can make it very simple. Um, person A gets, and I want to think, I think the, the amount that they said was $270 a week uh, and more than that. So they, just, they get $270 a week uh, if they were unemployed, fully unemployed. Uh, but through this work sharing, if they only if they are only their hours are cut for one day, um, then that's depending upon how many it is. That's what like ten percent. So you wouldn't get the full two seventy, but you would get ten percent of what you would normally get if you were fully unemployed. Um, that may seem a little complicated. So if there's a well, more better way to say that, uh, Dieter, can you help me out? Jeff Frischman, for the record. Um, 
that would be 20% one day because their hours would be cut by eight hours one day. So they would get $54 instead of the 270. Um, okay, so so it would it would be coming from whatever their pay would be if they were fully unemployed, correct? Uh, Jeff, personal for the record, it, yes, it would come from their UI, based on their UI benefits, they would be eligible for um, should they have been unemployed. It's a little bit garbled. I don't know if it, it is for anybody else. Jeff, I'll, I'll re-answer Jeff Frischman for, for the record. Um, it's not It's not from their pay, it's the 54, it, it would be what they would be eligible for from unemployment from their benefits. But otherwise, yes, you are correct. Madam Chairman, you're on mute. There we go. So their pay per week is $300 as an example. Um, and that's working five days. I hope I got this math simple enough for me to finish this. <laughs> five days and they get $300 a week. I was a poli sci major, not math, okay? Uh, <laughs> and so if they, they don't work one day, they can't work one day, what does that leave them in terms of the four days? Didn't hear the very end of that. Hmm? Uh, uh, Jeff Hirschman, for the record, I didn't hear the very end of your question. I'm sorry. Okay, so I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just trying to make sure I understand what the benefit of this would be. They're going to get their pay cut. It'll be twenty percent, and so twenty percent of the two seventy. I think you said was fifty four dollars. Jeff Hirschman, for the record, yes. Okay, so let's put that 54 to the side. And now they've got four days of wages because they're actually able to work four days. Um, and so that four days, they get that salary. Is that correct? Jeff Hirschman, for the record, I, I believe what we're doing is mixing up wages and pay versus unemployment benefit entitlement yeah so so here's what i'm trying to do i'm trying i'm trying to yeah I'm, I'm trying to see if i understand that 20 percent of something is better than 100 percent of nothing jeff freshman for the record typically that's a true statement yes okay yeah so and so that, that that's where i'm going i'm just trying to i'm trying to see if this benefits the four people who who have taken off that one day. Somebody takes off Friday, somebody takes off Monday, somebody takes off Wednesday, whatever, how, whatever the schematic is. They're going to get what they would have gotten, a percentage of that, what they would have gotten for unemployment. They're going to get that because their, their wages have been cut, their hours have been cut, whatever, whatever the qualifications are, they're going to get that. Them getting that does not negate them getting the regular pay for the rest of the time that they are able to work. Do I have that right? Jeff Freshman, for the record, yes. So um, my math ain't good, so let me come up with a new a new number. So so if the remaining amount minus that one day is two hundred and forty dollars um, for that week, they will get that plus the fifty four and the unemployment benefits, the percentage that they would be entitled to for unemployment benefits. Do I have that right? Jeff, first one for the record, yes. So 240 plus 254, that's what, uh, 290, 294? Jeff, first one for the record, I too am a poli sci major, but yes, those numbers <laughs> add up. Okay, so so they're gonna, they're gonna get, they won't get everything that they would have gotten, but they will get something. So they're not losing any pay by participating in this. And I guess, I guess that's my point. They don't they don't lose any of their, their regular pay that's separate from unemployment. They keep their regular pay, but because their hours or their days, whatever has been reduced, they are now eligible for a percentage of what they would get for unemployment. 
Jeff Christman, for the record, absolutely correct. So you take you take those two numbers, A plus B equals C. Jeff right? Christman, for the record, correct. Ah, well, you know, I got it right. I understand it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Senator Spearman, if I could jump in there really quick. I think the important part is, is that we're trying to prevent people from being totally laid off by this work sharing program. And the other important piece to this is in the amendment to respond to Senator Pickard's concern, uh, upon pas passage and approval, they will adopt regulations and do some other preparatory administrative work. And this will not take place until July 1st of 2022, which is for all intents and purposes, a good solid year or more away. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, and, and I guess that's really what I was getting at. If they're laid off, they don't get any other regular salary. They get whatever the amount is uh, for unemployment. So again, I say 20% of something is better than 100% of nothing. Uh, Senator Pickard, is that your hand still up or were you satisfied with uh, the answer? Before? Yes, Your Honor, or uh, yes, Madam Chair. Wow, well, now I'm, I'm doing it. Today. How about that? Yeah, uh, you've been elevated to a different branch of government. Um, I, uh, my, my concern is that the testimony we saw in the uh, uh, hearing was things like, you know, this is uh, a new program within their system, so they've got to adopt the regulations for it. Then they have to reprogram their services, which if you remember from the testimony on SB 75, uh, part of the reason they had to stand up a separate system for the uh, PUA program was because they couldn't get programmers uh, on the 30-year-old the COBOL system that UI is currently under. And so uh, it sounds to me like we're, we're just exacerbating the existing problem. And Dieter hasn't even asked that we don't have one bill uh, that's been introduced to actually fix the problems that exist. People aren't getting paid in a timely fashion. And I appreciate the fact that we did get the response from Dieter as to their backlog. They It looks like they've essentially worked through it and that's wonderful, but the, we haven't fixed, we haven't even addressed the underlying problems. And so all this bill is gonna do is pile more on to a system that can't do it. And nobody's asked for the money to, uh, uh, to rebuild the system. So we end up uh, expanding services when we haven't even addressed the core mission of Dieter uh, and their ability, the resources and the ability to do it. So I think while this is certainly laudable and I completely agree that 20% is better than zero, no question about that. I just think we're adding fuel to a, a raging dumpster fire and it's time to address the actual issues before we expand their services. I have a real problem with that. Uh, Marilyn Dondero Loop for the record. Senator Pickard, I feel your passion, but I have worked very closely with Dieter. And um, I do believe Dieter has worked very hard. And I do believe that um, as with furloughs, by the way, we give people a day off and we don't pay them. So, but we've uh, restored those to most of them, and they've I, done a I, wonderful I, job at getting up to this point. Senator Pickard, I let, let her finish. Let her finish. I understand your passion, but my feeling is it is better to have someone employed and not on full unemployment and work share than not. And this will not take effect until 2022, sir. No question about that, but I'd be really interested to hear from Dieter uh, how they're going to reprogram a system for this when they couldn't reprogram the system for a, a basic, uh, 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 the, the, for the PUA program. It sounds like we haven't addressed the underlying issues that will be an impediment to doing this uh, in, within this year's time frame. I just, I don't see how it's even possible and I think it's inappropriate to be expanding their mission when we can't even uh, uh, adequately uh, uh, get our way through their existing mission. Madam Chair. Yeah, hold, hold on, let's see if, uh, I think the question was asked for Dieter, so let's see if they will answer first and then uh, Senator uh, Hardy, I'll come back to you. 
Thank you, Chair Spearman. This is Elisa Caparetta with Dieter. Um, I, I would uh, respond uh, with a couple of uh, updates. One is uh, a, dis a, a, a business and program decision was made early on in the pandemic when Congress was passing several new programs that we needed to implement. Uh, what is the best way for the agency to implement both additional benefits on a weekly basis for uh, all folks in unemployment and that we've done in both systems, PUA and UI. But the, the PUA system was actually a whole brand new program. And uh, again, it was a it was a business and program decision that it would be uh, more effective uh, to implement that as a separate program. Um, and part, a lot of that had to do with the number of programs we were being asked to do in, a, in an extremely short time frame. So, you, you know, the, the bill passed, the CARES Act passed Congress and, and they wanted that stood up as soon as possible. This is vastly different. We have uh, a year to develop the business requirements and, and put the changes in place. I believe our team uh, is fully capable of uh, doing that in a year. So uh, just as we have been able to, in very short timeframes, uh, implement the additional programs that Congress has given us, uh, including lost wages and uh, and the pandemic extended unemployment compensation. So that is one aspect. Uh, the other aspect is uh, Senator Pickard keeps asking about, you know, where is the money to solve the problems now? Um, I would, you are, you are not a money committee, but I would share with you that there is $1.5 million in each of the next two years of the biennium to do some of the immediate stabilization and capacity building within the system. Um, so that certainly is in our budget uh, and you'll see that when it comes to the money committees. Well, I appreciate that. I remember the testimony in SB 75 being you needed 40 million. So I think that will probably fall short. But uh, if your testimony is that you can fix the problem, get the uh, uh, pieces to talk to each other, uh, then uh, I don't understand why uh, uh, the testimony in SB uh, 75 even occurred. In any event, I still think it's a mistake to, uh, anyway, I don't need to repeat it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Madam Chair, if I, if I might just clarify, um, the $40 million is uh, the middle of the range for a completely new modernized system, which is certainly something that is on our radar, um, that would be a separate conversation where, that we are having with the governor's office, just what the appropriate vehicle is. Um, this, this proposal would not require an integration between the PUA and the UI systems. It, this would only be in the regular UI system because you're talking about employers. So uh, the, the stabilization funding that's there immediately to address our UI system specifically um, would be what would be needed to implement, stabilize, improve the capacity and speed of the regular UI system. All right. And I thought your testimony or, or uh, Mr. Fishburne's testimony during the SB 75 hearing was that the uh, UI system was based in COBOL. It's hard to find uh, um, uh, programmers that can even work in that uh, environment anymore and that it takes months to get them on, under contract, let alone get the work done. So uh, unless that testimony wasn't accurate, then I still don't see how we can resolve this in a timely fashion and in, in a way that's efficient. Alisa uh, Caporetta, for the record, uh, our, that testimony is accurate. There is a core part of the program that does rely on COBOL, um, but we are in the process of bringing in uh, contractors who can make those updates. And with a year to implement the program, we certainly would have enough time to do the stabilization and uh, make the changes that are needed. Okay, um, Senator Settlemeyer. 
And uh, I think there's a, a good, this, this is not a money committee. So uh, if there is to be any um, money involved, um, then I'm pretty sure that um, Senator Brooks will pull it off um, whatever reading it's on and pull it into finance. So um, I, th I think we can figure that out. So let's, let's ask, let's get down to the policy issues here. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate that. I'm sorry that earlier I wasn't logged on right away. I also am having some internet problems. I sincerely suggest and request that if anybody gets kicked off the internet anymore, we actually think about going old school and all of us that are in the building actually going to the committee room and thus alleviating this internet debacle. But that's just my opinion. That being said, on the actual bill that is in front of us, 308, I'm curious, does this apply to just all union shops, all those that decide to participate in the work share program, because that wasn't made real clear within my notes I wrote down. It really didn't come out really well during the training. Or does this apply to all employers or is an exemption if you're smaller, no offense, agriculture? Uh, who does this apply to? Jeffrey Churchman, for the record, this, any employer, Union, non-union, it, it, that has nothing to do with this bill, whether the union or non-union. Any employer with two or more employees in this in a specific group would be eligible to participate. And when I say in a specific group, what I'm talking about is that they would have to be two like employees that share the same tasks. Two plumbers to carpenters, to food servers, would be in a, considered a group. So any employer with two or more employees in the same group would be eligible to participate in this program. But they if I could follow up on that. So I'm a little bit worried that some can, of the smaller employers are not as sophisticated to be able to deal with this. Because to me, this seems like something that probably you need to have a pretty good amount of employees to make this apply to. But I mean, you're not actually suggesting, though, that Dieter has the authority over agricultural workers on a family farm. I mean, I, to my knowledge, federal law is pretty clear that I am outside of the scope of Dieter. Are you saying that I'm now inside the scope of Dieter? Jeff, firstly, for the record, um, as we previous, as I go direct, go direct. <clears throat> Okay, Jeff Richland, for the record, as I had previously testified that this is an opt-in program. Nobody's requiring any employer, whether an agricultural employee or not, or, or any type of employer, it doesn't matter. It's an opt-in. The employer has the ability to participate based on a business decision that that particular employer makes. So no, that, that that's not what this bill does. It's you opt into the program. You're not required to participate. Okay. What happens if somebody opts in that isn't part of the deed or system? You know, smaller family businesses and things of that nature. How does that work? I mean, we actually during this pandemic ended up giving deeder resources to individuals that have never paid into deeder, and that was a decision that was made. Uh, to help individuals out and it was made also by the federal government to make them eligible for the person you know the six hundred dollars and the three hundred dollar increase you know even though they've never the employer has never paid in any way shape or form into the program so i'm just kind of curious how are you leaving it to just people that currently pay into unemployment insurance or is this eligible for people who even don't pay into it Jeff Frischman, for the record, this would be for any covered employment. This is for the UI program. PUA, which is the program that you described as for people who never paid in, et cetera, the way you uh, characterize that, that's a whole separate program. This is strictly for those participating and employers in the UI program, your regular type of employers, what you would consider a regular employee employer relationship. I really appreciate that. And I appreciate the clarification, getting that on the record. I'm still concerned because I just think that smaller employers, you're asking them to come away from a mom and pop operation, potentially to think about doing this type of work 
and then if they have three employees and those three employees are constantly saying they want this program, I don't know. I, I, I think it can be very problematic for the smaller employers. I wish we could have, I don't know. It's, it's difficult to try to figure out, but I appreciate the answers and the time. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so, Madam Chair, Marilyn Dondero, for the record, I just want to confirm with Senator Spearman, I mean, Senator Settlemeyer, excuse me. This is, I will repeat, an opt-in program. So if I want to do this and I'm at a store and you're in a store right next to me and I decide to do it, you don't have to do that. And I would also tell you that there are a lot of people and companies that pay into unemployment that have never used it. So it kind of goes both ways. So this is an opt-in. You, you go to Dieter and you opt in. Nobody's saying your family farm or anybody's family farm, but maybe the guy that sells the corn wants to do it. So there is, there is no mandate that you do this, but it does help your fellow citizen. I appreciate the concept of that, uh, Senator, very much. And the larger agricultural operations do have to pay into Dieter. And so as indicated, they would be considered a covered employee would be allowed to opt into that. Could create a situation though, where you then started having, which is maybe that's a good thing for employees to sit there and say, well, you didn't give me this option and therefore I'm gonna go quit you and I'm gonna go work for that guy. Of course, sometimes two weeks later, you find out that other guy's no good and you wanna go back the other way. So I don't know, I'm, a lot of confusion. Thank you. Yeah, there there is a lot of confusion on your part, and I'll be happy to explain it. But that's not the way it works. Thank you very much. You call on Vice Chair Neal. So thank you, uh, Chair Spearman. I, I I respect this dialogue that's happening, um, but I would like to call the question so we can vote on this measure to try to move it out of committee, please. Question's been called. We have the motion correct. We have a I'll second, second correct? Okay. Um, motion was made by Senator Lang, is that right? Senator Neal. Senator Neal. Madam Neal. Chair, by... Madam Chair, Hello? Senator Scheibel made the motion to amend due passes and it was seconded by Senator Neal. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Thank you for keeping notes. Um, so, Madam Secretary, please do a roll call vote. Senator Hardy. I'm going to uh, be a yes, but reserve my right. I want to know, you know, the number of applications that we're getting, the backlog that we have. I think we've appreciated fewer fraudulent things, but where do we stand with that? I think we're talking about hands-on stuff and not just computers. And do we have the hands that can do this in Dieter? And I think we have uh, one year to stabilize to do this, and I, I need more information. So I will be voting uh, a yes, but I need more information and regret that this uh, uh, motion was called. Thank you. Senator Lang? Yes. Senator Neal? Yes. Senator Pickard? No. Senator Scheibel? Yes. Senator Settlemeyer? Chair Spearman? Yes. Senator Settlemeyer? No. Okay, let the record show that the uh, motion passes and Senator Dondero Loop, uh, will you take the floor statement? I will, Madam Chair, and thank you to you and the committee. Thank you. Um, I think we still have, what, is it three more bills, Mr. Magalejo? Did I get that right? Madam Chair, you are correct. Okay, three more bills. Um, so let's go to uh, 282. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Cesar Magarejo, Committee Policy Analyst, Senate Bill 282 revises provisions relating to real estate and sponsored by Senator Dennis. Uh, Rocky Finseth, uh, Carrera, Nevada, proposes the following amendment, which is attached to this work session document. Amend sections 1, 5, 9, 11, and 19 to delete the respective chapters of NRS regarding the newly proposed administrative administration accounts Instead, the amendment provides that the establish, for the establishment of the account for the real estate administration, 
with within the state general fund. Amendment number two is delete provisions of sections 1, 5, 9, 11, and 21 regarding the requirement that uh, money collected from the technology fee, technology fee be separately accounted for and used for acquiring and maintaining technology used by, by the division. Amendment number three adds a new section to the bill to amend NRS uh, 645.842 to reduce from 300,000 to 100,000 the minimum balance maintained in the real estate education research and recovery fund. In addition, the amendment removes the provisions that any funds over the minimum uh, remaining in the fund be set aside and used for real estate education and research or for any purpose authorized by the legislature. Instead, the amendment provides that any balance over the minimum be deposited to the account for real estate administration. Amendment number four deletes sections 15, 16, 17, 18 concerning the deposit and authorized use of certain money concerning common interest communities and condominium hotels. Amendment number five amends section 24 to remove NRS uh, 116A.220, which will repeal provisions concerning the deposit of certain money to the account for common interest communities and condominium hotels. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, the sponsors of the bill and the director, uh, administrator of uh, real estate division are available on Zoom to clarify uh, whether there are any additional amendments than those proposed here in the, in the work session document. Okay, thank you, Mr. Megalejo. Um, and I just, I, I don't, I want to be clear about something. It's a little bit after 11, and I know everybody that's in this committee is probably on another committee. And I'm trying to be respectful of the fact that the other committees may want to meet, not late, but maybe want to meet early. So we're not here again till midnight um, tonight. So that's why I'm, I'm asking if we've covered the subject then, and there's anything new uh, that we need to find out, then let's do that. But let's be respectful that there are going to be some other committees. Um, that have to meet this afternoon, and we want to make sure that they have ample time to do that. So, are there any questions, additional questions that have not been asked or answered? Madam Chair, Joe Hardy. Yes, sir. In keeping that in mind, um, I would just uh, recognize that I can be positive and reserve the right to change my vote and move this along. That would be good. We're going to need to have a motion. Do I hear a motion? I would move to approve and reserve my right to uh, change my mind. Okay, so is that amend, do pass? Amend, do pass. I'll second Chair Spearman. Have a motion from, motion from Senator Hardy, second from Senator Lang discussion on something we've not already covered. Madam Secretary, please. Madam roll. Chair, if I might just, uh, uh, I, I again think it's a mistake uh, to charge for something that the uh, division can already pay for themselves. So duly I'll noted. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, let's make Madam, sure we have that in the notes. Madam Chair, this is Cesar McRejo, Committee Policy Analyst for the record. Um, before the, the work session, there was a couple of conversations back and forth, whether there would be additional amendments. Uh, can we, it would be possible to get the sponsors to clarify that these are all the amendments. Sponsors on the line. Madam Chair, this is Senator Dennis. Um, we, and, and uh, we also have Mr. Finseth on the line. Um, I believe the only other amendment that needs to be done, um, and we are still trying to work this issue out, but we figured it would go to finance. So is the amount that gets re gets um, put back to the general fund. Um, so it's just the percentage and we're still working on that. But that um, as far as the policy issues, that was something that um, that we didn't because we got the language late. We didn't want to try to um, make that change before it went to finance. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, so with that, I have a motion that has been seconded. Madam Secretary, please do a roll call vote. Senator Hardy? Yes, but reserve my right. Senator Lang? Yes. Senator Neal? Uh, yes. Senator Pickard? No. Senator Scheibel? Yes. Senator Settlemeyer? 
Yes, with reservations. Chair Spearman. Yes. Let the record show that the motion does carry. And uh, Senator Dennis, will you take the floor statement? Yes, I will. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, let's move on now to SB 186. I think that's what's next, correct? And then 408. Yes. Last. Okay. Yeah, we, I put 408 last. I want to make sure that everything that needs to be worked out has been worked out to the best of your ability. And whatever has not been worked out, then it's really just a matter of trying to do some amendments to um, either make it work or not. So, Mr. Magarejo. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Cesar Magarejo, Committee Policy Analyst. Uh, Senate Bill 186 revises provisions relating to collection agencies and was sponsored by this committee and was heard yesterday. Senator Spearman proposes the following conceptual amendments, which is to delete uh, subsection four of section one, which would have required a collection agency to include in the report to the commissioner certain information concerning demographic information of a debtor, instead require a, co a collection agency to include in the report the zip code of each debtor from whom the collection agency collected a debt for a homeowners association. And Madam Chair, I believe that's all the amendments. Uh, thank you. And just one correction. Uh, if I remember correctly, the fourth word in on that line was without and that came before any of the demographics. So we changed the wording so that people would understand that without means you don't include it. And we just went to zip code. So uh, it, the bill never asked them to collect demographics. It said if available, but without. And so last I checked without means you ain't got nothing. So, um, and the amendments are there to clarify the, clarify the language. Additional questions? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion. Commander do pass. I have a motion from Vice Chair Neal. Do I have a second? Second, Madam Chair. I have a second from Senator Lang. Further discussion? Madam Secretary, please do a roll call vote. Madam Chair. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is Senator Sotomayor. I'm still very concerned with the bill. It changes how HOAs work, and I'm a little bit worried about how that will play out. Uh, in that respect, I'm going to vote no, but I'll reserve my right and see if I can try to find a place for it. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Additional questions? Senator Pickard? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I was actually thinking the same along the same lines. Um, I think it's kind of sad that it's where it started. I like where uh, uh, it's ended up, but uh, this would cause a wholesale change to how uh, community management companies uh, do their jobs. And I think uh, while it's well intended, I think we need to uh, uh, avoid doing damage to that industry. Thank you. Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, I appreciate the zip code change. And so I will be voting for this with reserving my right, trying to figure out uh, how we can protect normal business transactions that protect people on uh, every way they may appear. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, let's, uh, Madam Secretary, let's do a roll call vote. We may even be able to get lunch. <laughs> Senator Hardy. Yes, reserving my right to change. Senator Lang? Yes. Senator Neal? Yes. Senator Pickard? No. Senator Scheibel? Yes. Senator Settlemeyer? No. Chair Spearman? Yes. Let the record show that the motion does pass, and I'll take the floor statement. Thank you all. Uh, now, I believe the end is in sight. Senate Bill 408, which we heard this morning. Um, Mr. Kent, were you all able to get to a place of go with those who were at questions and able to uh, do something with section one? And I think we concluded that uh, that would be okay. The, the changes that had been made would indeed protect um, small businesses. Is that correct? 
186 or 401? Uh, 408. Madam, yes. Madam Chair, just uh, this is our McGraw for record. Uh, so just to notify the, the members of the committee, the work session document for SB 408 is included uh, up on Nellis or is uploaded up on Nellis. Uh, again, you might have to refresh your page, uh, but we have included the work session document, uh, which reflects the original amendment submitted by Mr. Kent. And uh, Mr. Kent was also able to submit a second document that's also attached to this work session document, which addresses some of the concerns that were brought up during this morning's hearing. Madam Chair? Yes. Um, My major problems and concerns were within section one, Madam Chair, just uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, Senator, Senator Settlemeyer. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the amendments Question. that were done to section one. That's where I had the most, a lot of my concern and angst with some of those issues. In that respect, I think the document does a good job of reflecting those changes. And if you're amenable, I'd say amend and do pass based on the most recent document whenever you're willing to entertain said motion. Okay, I need, need to make sure that the questions, because this is this is a bill that we had not discussed two or three times. Um, someone was getting ready to say something when Senator Settlemeyer was talking. I was going to say second. Okay, uh, so let's hold that in advance. Any other questions, clarifications? Um, so, Mr. Megarajo, do you have anything to add in terms of expounding on what the um, amendments did or do? Uh, Madam Chair, just as uh, Senator Settermeyer uh, indicated, the amendment does delete the sections one and 12 uh, in their entirety. And the amendment, the initial proposed amendment also uh, deletes proposed language in subsection 1K of section three. And then the, the secondary document submitted uh, by Mr. Kent does delete proposed language in line 12 of section 11. And finally, it deletes uh, subsection 1G of section nine, which I believe Senator Neal uh, had concerns. Thank you. Uh, now that we've heard that, additional questions other than the ones we've heard? Okay, Madam Secretary, please do a roll call vote. Senator Hardy? Yes. Senator Lang? Yes. Senator Neal? Yes. Senator Pickard? Yes. Senator Scheibel? Yes. Senator Settlemeyer? Yes. Chair Spearman. Yes. And the motion carries. Um, Senator Settlemeyer, you want to take the floor statement? Sure. Thank you. Ah, okay. So I believe we have completed our work. Is that correct, Mr. Magorejo? We have all the bills that that we could hear and could pass out. The 408 was the last one on work session, correct? Madam Chair, that's correct. Okay. Madam Chair. Yes, sir. Uh, on SB 276, I would like to reserve my right. Uh, I voted yes, but reserve my right to change. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Do we note it? Well, I want to thank everybody for your hard work. Um, and for your patience. Um, the one thing that I can't, I can't lay claim to, and that is that I'm perfect, but I hope that um, I've done the job so well that you know that my heart uh, meant to be perfect. Um, again, thank our staff for going above and beyond. Um, that includes the staff that's here in the office as well as our broadcast staff. Uh, when I said 7.30 this morning, when I said that yesterday, I thought to myself, oh my God, BPS would have to get here at four o'clock in the morning. So um, I thank you all for going the extra mile as well. And thank you all committee members for, <clears throat> excuse me, working through this as best we can. Uh, and so with that uh, broadcast, open up the phones for public comment, please. Yes, Chair. If you'd like to speak in public comment, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Again, if you would like to speak in public comment, please press star nine now.
Chair, you have no callers for public comment at this time. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we've done uh, two straight weeks of every day. So on Monday, uh, the meeting will be canceled and we will pick it up again on our regular meeting day, uh, Wednesday. And I hope and pray that everyone has a very safe and happy weekend. Have I left anything undone? Madam Chair? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. In that respect, as you said earlier, I know it's a little bit bizarre in this virtual environment. I mean, this is, after all, the very first time we have ever uh, had committee house first passage in a completely virtual realm. Uh, and traditionally in the past, you as chair and other chairs have always kind of given a clap to our staff for, well, in my opinion, putting up with us because it's not always easy. So in that respect, I don't know if anybody can unmute, but thank you to the staff and everybody for helping us out. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I hope that they, they know how much we um, appreciate them. Uh, the good part about doing this in um, a virtual environment is that uh, there were a couple of days I had like four different places to be, and it would have been almost impossible to skate up and down the halls to get from one committee room to another. So this is this has been good. All I had to do was just, you know, press a couple buttons log out of one meeting and log into the other to the next and I could get there on time. So there um, there are some good aspects of this and I thank God for that. So with that, any additional comments? All righty, then I will see you all on Wednesday, um, April, somebody give me the date. That April, April 14th. April 14th, April 14th. Uh, we'll see you on April the 14th, take Monday to make sure that you got all, everything you need, get your taxes in. And with that, we are now adjourned.